Thanks, Kelly, and, and thanks, Collis, and um, just thanks to the incredible team that has really been putting out a lot of time and effort to make this session happen. You know, I know that a year ago, um, unfortunately, Slow uh, Fish Summit was postponed because of COVID, so it's just really exciting to be able to gather here virtually um, together today. So um, first, just a quick introduction about myself, and then we're going to um, jump into our, our deep dive here. Um, my name is Elizabeth Herendine, and I, I live and work on the traditional lands of the Dinah Ena people here in Alaska. Um, I've spent the last 15 or so years working to promote and protect wild salmon fisheries in the Pacific Northwest as well as Alaska. A lot of that time has been working um, throughout the entire seafood supply chain from the water to the plate. Um, and I've been working especially closely with direct marketers and commercial fishermen and helping them tell their stories and access new markets around the country, spend some time doing consulting, also working for regional seafood development associations throughout Alaska. And I currently work for an Alaska-based advocacy organization um, called Salmon State. And then we work, work to protect the wild places that wild salmon depend on and the people who, who depend on those fish. Um, I'm also on the executive committee of the local catch network um, as well. So, Today we're going to take a deep dive into the seafood supply chain and we're going to hear from a really incredible range of leaders throughout the supply chain and get a chance to hear some of their stories, the lessons and ideas um, that they've been learning throughout their day-to-day -day operations and years of experience in the supply chain. You know, we'll hear some of the challenges as well as the successes um, and how they've been helping create more direct si supply chains that are built on transparency, trust, and fair pricing. And just, you know, as we listen to their stories and different perspectives, I encourage all of you to think about, you know, how you in your own work and your own link of the supply chain can help replicate these models elsewhere and, you know, really help create the, the kind of food system that we all envision and, and are striving for. You know, also encourage you to think about how do we engage more chefs and other storytellers who are ambassadors, you know, for, for what we're doing and slow fish and slow food. Um, and lastly, how do we just cultivate stronger relationships through our business transactions and day-to-day -day operations? So again, hopefully the stories you hear, you know, are not only interesting, but spark some ideas as far as how you can integrate what you hear and are you know, in your own, in your own work, in your own lives. So our goal, you know, for the next few hours is to dig into some of the challenges and opportunities out there that we're all facing in our own corner of the, the ocean and, you know, come together at the end of this discussion with some concrete next steps and ideas for, you know, act actions we can take moving forward over the coming weeks and months and years. So, you know, we really do want to come out of this with some specific uh, next steps and actions we can take collectively. So with that, you know, I encourage you all to get comfortable. Um, we're gonna be here a while, feel free to move, go get food, liquid, whatever you need, um, but otherwise get comfortable and we're gonna dive into our first round of stories. Um, so to kick things off, we're gonna hear from several uh, fisherwomen around the country who are doing some really incredible and inspiring things to help bring local seafood to their local communities and really embody what Slow Fish is all about. Um, so we're going to start with Kayla Cox, who is the co-owner of New England Fishmongers, um, which is a growing day boat seafood company that's focused on bringing sustainably caught fish directly to local communities in New England. And they work directly with fishermen um, who are bringing wild products, um, not just from New England, but also other places like Alaska or the Gulf to New England consumers and helping build a network of like-minded fishermen. So um, Kayla, I'm going to turn this over to you. Can you see my up? We've got you, yep. Okay, awesome never used hop in before but um so my name is Kayla um I work and manage New England fishmongers and we are um based out of Dover New Hampshire but we have one commercial fishing vessel that we keep in Portsmouth New Hampshire 
Um, we work in Mass, uh, New Hampshire, and Maine. So we're kind of like a tri-state seafood business. Um, but we sell all of our own fish that we catch ourselves, as well as some other products from different fishermen around the country, like um, Yakobi Fisheries out of Pelican, Alaska, and Taku River Reds. And um, we sell um, Lance Nasio's shrimp from Anna Marie Shrimp in Louisiana. And we, um, we've we been working really hard to create a following for the other wild products that we've offered starting this year. And people are really liking it because um, you just can't really find wild salmon or wild shrimp of good quality in New England um, at most of your like fish markets around here. So we've, um, we opened up our own processing plant in Dover um, this past year and it's still in the works kind of, we're getting a, a new walk-in and um, a walk-in blast freezer installed over the next month. So we have a lot going on and we're also doing a major overhaul on our um, fishing vessel too. So we are really busy right now. <laughs> yep. Um, so what else do, do you guys have questions specifically about what we do here? We um, with our direct sales model or? Yeah, so we're gonna actually, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up questions. Um, for, it looks like a lot of you are already putting the chat to good use. So please, um, you know, oh. type any questions that folks have from the audience. Um, and Kayla, we're gonna come back to you for kind of digging into mm -hmm. to more questions um, in a little bit here, but yeah, and then we'll kind of, we'll go from there. So thank you. Sounds um, good, yeah. Okay. Um, next, we're just gonna introduce our, one of our next storytellers, um, Jordan Kasslunger from Tuna Harbor Dockside Market in San Diego. Um, Jordan is the third generation fisherman in San Diego. She grew up in a fishing family and for the last six years has worked on the Tuna Harbor Dockside Market, helping connect local consumers to local seafood. Um, she also serves on the Slow Food Urban San Diego Seafood Liaison, is also on the Local Catch um, Executive Committee. So Jordan, we're gonna have you also just introducing yourself, sharing a little bit about your business and your story, and then we'll, we'll get into some more questions with you both. Um, good morning, everybody. I am Jordan. Um, I'm based out of San Diego, like Elizabeth said. Um, I'm a third generation commercial fisherman. I started fishing with my dad uh, when I was a, a young child and he started fishing with my grandfather um, when he was right out of high school and kind of decided that he didn't want to be working for anyone else. He wanted to keep fishing and so he's been doing it for 40 years. Um, I have been part of Tuna Harbor Dockside Market, which is a weekly outdoor um, open air seafood market on Saturdays. It's run by the fishermen for the fishermen. So every Saturday, eight to three or until one, depending on if we sell out before that, the fishermen and their families, their wives, their kids, friends um, will come and sell their species direct to the consumer. And so we'll kind of rotate our species throughout the year, depending on what's in season, uh, the weather, things like that. And over the last six years, we've, we've uh, created a really deep um, connection, I would say, to the sum of the public. We have a lot of return customers, people that have been coming for six years, people that were really new to the market with COVID about a year ago, but they've continued to come back every weekend since. Um, we've also developed an online pickup system, which Sarah has, has utilized a few times. Um, and so people can order online and then pick up on Saturdays if they aren't comfortable having to walk through the market, if they still don't want to be outdoors. I also am one of two co-chairs on the Slow Fish San Diego. Um, I'm one of their liaisons. And so we work really to consume, I'm sorry, not to consume, yes, to consume fish, but also to, to connect the consumer to their fishermen. And so we recently, right before COVID shut everything down, we had started an educational program, which has kind of been put on hold, but we are kind of gonna switch to a different model for that, that's remote and online. Um, as well as we previously would do seafood Saturdays. So one Saturday a month, we would bring chefs into the market and let the consumer and the public get to know local chefs, but also learn how to clean or utilize different parts of the fish. 
Awesome. Thanks, Jordan. Yeah, you guys definitely have a lot, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot going on. Um, great. Well, I don't, this is a question for our back end people. Is it possible to have both Kayla and Jordan on the screen here? Oops. Yeah. Oh, maybe. <laughs> All right. I, I think so. Okay. I am also new to Hopin, so bear with us as we figure out the tech. Um, well, Jordan, maybe while we're um, bringing Kayla back back here, I'm just curious if you can speak a little bit to, um, you know, some of the changes that you guys have seen this past year and how you all have adapted. You know, COVID has obviously changed so much for everyone and just with having a physical location, just how you guys have adapted to that and what you see moving forward. Yeah, so um, pre-COVID on Saturdays, people was kind of just a free-for-all and so everyone could come and go as they please, stay as long as they wanted. We had food vendors and so they could hang out and just enjoy the sun and the view. And then when everything shut down, because we are an outdoor market, um, we, haven't, we haven't closed at all. We've remained open the entire time, but we had to follow the city's guidelines on um, capacity. And so because we are outdoors and we're on a pier, we had to do 50 people um, at a time besides the the vendors. And so it was, it was an additional 50 people. And so instead of just being able to walk in, we had to have a line that at one point I think was up to like two hours because in the beginning people would panic by and just like be there forever buying multiple like huge whole fish. And then as time went on and the months kind of settled and we all got, I guess, comfortable with COVID or, you know, the, the new normal, people stopped buying in bulk and kind of were just they started coming every weekend instead and so now it's still a line but definitely online that has been almost a year since we started doing online it's helped alleviate some of the people that are standing waiting but i think people also like the reason to be outdoors on a saturday um, and so our biggest change or addition during covid was our online ordering which varies every week depending again with seasons and who's fishing for what but we offer fillet fish as well as like whole and live species online and people just drive up in their car, tell us their last name and we hand them their order and then they go on their way. Um, and we've also partnered with um, some folks doing, it's called uh, Fish to Families. And so more fish on Saturdays is also going to um, individuals in need of meals. I believe they do it twice a week. Um, and so you can pick up meals, no questions asked, um, with fish that they are util utilizing from the market on Saturdays. That's great. Yeah, I feel like one of the real bright spots in COVID this past year is just seeing how fishing families and small boat fishermen have really stepped up all over the country to help meet just this huge uh, rise in demand for access to healthy food. And so it's just been really um, overwhelming in a good way to see fishermen helping meet that demand and, and take care of their neighbors um, at this, this, this pretty stressful time. So that's awesome to hear about. Um, Kayla, I'm gonna, we're gonna turn back to you. You know, you were sharing in your introduction just how you, you guys open a processing plant. Um, I know that can be a real barrier for a lot of smaller seafood operations out there and like it's a huge investment right and it's pretty scary and a lot of risk mm -hmm. that comes with it and just wondering if you could expand on that a little bit both what was the decision making process to make that kind of investment and take that step and you know how has that been going and have there been things that came up that you didn't anticipate or any um mm -hmm. lessons or surprises along the way with that yeah, so um, like you were right, it was pretty scary to, to decide to open up our own processing plant. Um, Tim, who is the other owner of the company, and I are the operations managers. We basically like run the whole show here. We don't have like another manager to help us here. And we're actually looking to hire someone because it's, it's a lot of work. Um, and we're still putting place together and we're basically funding it on our own up until hopefully soon we're gonna have someone help us out with um, some other things that we need to outfit the facility with. But um, basically we put it together piece by piece just with the profits we were making each week. We would buy another piece of equipment like a 
and in um, and any commercial equipment is like so expensive. I I couldn't even like wrap my head around the prices of some of the things we had to buy. Um, and also the whole food safety aspect um, to have a HACCP plan written. And we worked with food safety consultants um, to look, to write up our whole HACCP plan, which is like hundreds of pages long, just all of the standard operating procedures for processing seafood. Um, and then training our employees how to process seafood as well. Um, luckily, we were able to work with a company in the past who we rented space from and their food safety manager really helped us learn um, all about seafood processing. So we had a pretty good idea of how it went. Um, but we basically did it out of necessity because there are so few processors in New England that um, we could really work with to have our fish cut. And even though we were selling quite a bit of fish whole, it's, it's really a hard market. In New England, a lot of people want the fillets. Um, people really, <laughs> are, it's a hard sell, <laughs> the whole fish thing sometimes. So we knew we wanted to get into selling the fillets. Um, and also we scallop too. We have, a, our boat um, is a scalloper as well. So um, having a place where we can package our scallops and sell them within 24 hours is huge because so many people have never tasted fish that fresh before when it's, it was caught the day before. Um, so having complete control of our product from A to Z has been huge for us. Um, a lot of people have said, I've never tasted seafood this fresh in my life. Like the scallops sometimes still like twitch when you touch them. Like the customers say, I brought the scallops home to eat. Um, I bought them at your market and they're so fresh that they're literally still like contracting. <laughs> So uh, I think a lot of people have seen um, a big difference um, since we we're able to control how fast we get our fish from our boat to the consumer. Um, but it's definitely easy. Like we, the last year and a half, we haven't slept much. <laughs> Honestly, we worked like really long nights um, and have had like pretty limited resources to do this, but we're just starting to kind of like round the corner now. So it's really coming together. Well, we have refrigerated vehicles, deliveries, um, and we have like four or five market staff or teenagers. So they go to like the farmer's markets and farm stands and sell the fish and they're doing well and they're learning a lot. Um, but managing people I found is is the hardest part of the business and um, the fishing is actually the easiest part. <laughs> so. so I think that a lot of people listening would agree with you. And I think, you know, a lot of fishermen I talk to fish because they like having quiet and space. So mm -hmm. yeah. 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 People. You yeah, um, the job I basically starts to get back to the dock. <laughs> Um, well, both of you have touched on sort of this idea of using the whole fish, and I'm wondering if we could dig into that a little bit more and just some of the ways you guys have gone about educating consumers um, and maybe also educating consumers on seafood varieties that they're not used to, you know, and, and local fish that maybe hasn't been as accessible, you know, in in recent years and might be intimidating for people. So. What are tools, what are outreach methods you all have used in educating people about using the whole fish or learning how to fillet on their own and also using varieties of seafood that they might not know and haven't tried before? Jordan, if you want to kick us off. <laughs> um, yeah, so at the market, um, what really helped us too was a lot of the restaurants that we would direct uh, source to or sell our fish to, they would kind of alter their menus to meet whatever was in season, whatever the fishermen had to provide. I work at one of the restaurants um, that we sell to. And so I was, it was, it's been a cool experience over the last two and a half years working there to be able to tell people that this is why we don't carry species that aren't like local to our waters because we source directly from the fishermen. So it's gonna vary with what they have in season, what they're catching, who is fishing. Um, and people have responded really well to it, both at the restaurant and at the market with these uh, seafood Saturdays that we would do, we would try to have the chef that was doing a demonstration that month pick a lesser known species if they were familiar with working with it. And so that way people were able to 
like taste the food that they or the fish that they might not be comfortable with. So that was a big help um, for a lot of people. We also had a family a family doing fish sandwiches and tacos, and the fisherman. Um, it was his wife, his two boys, and myself pre-COVID, um, and so we would kind of alter our menu for food at the market as well to vary with whatever was available. And so a lot of times it was the bycatch or the lesser known species and people were always very skeptical, but after trying it and trusting that we were a fishing family, we weren't going to lead them down the wrong path. They, um, they always, we never had any complaints about like the different species. If anything, people would say, you know, I never knew that that's what this tasted like, or I would have never been comfortable enough to try that. And so that has been the biggest, or that was the biggest tool at the market um, prior to COVID. Right now, we just, we've had a lot of little like cutout sheets from Sea Grant and from Noah, I believe, that have different like fillets and loins to the fish. And so people can take little um, information pamphlets, they can ask questions. We have videos on our website that um, people have responded really well to. But if we're able to compare what they're looking for to what we have, people are are pretty willing and open to trying new things or so we've experienced in the last six years we've never had anyone try something and not like it the next following week great thank you and Kayla I don't know if you've got more to add to that from own experience um yeah so we catch a lot of like weird species well that many people have never even heard of or tried um like also some smaller species like hake and herring will sell um which i think is really great for people to try because we we bleed and brine them and take really good care of the the mackerel that we catch in the summer um so seeing people try new species it's they're always coming back saying oh what's new this week and they don't have like a an idea in their mind of what they're coming to the market to buy. They kind of just trust us and whatever is fresh and good. Um, they let us kind of like tell them what's what's good that week and what's in season. Um, we also work with um, Yakobi Fisheries in Alaska and they send us some um, parts of the salmon, like the salmon bellies mm -hmm. that you really can't find in New England for sale anywhere. Um, and it's some of the best part of the fish so we sell out of that really quickly too. People love it. And also salmon burger, but they, they scrape the meat off of the backbones of the fish. And it's kind of like ground beef, but it's raw salmon. So it's a great way to utilize like the whole the whole fish and not let the meat go to waste. Um, and we have we've gained like a pretty big following for the salmon burger recently. Um so yeah, different cuts of the fish. And also we for a while, we were making dog treats with the fish skins. Um, so we were dehydrating the fish skins after we filleted them. And um, we, when we moved into the new processing plant, like we don't have like the ventilation system for the dehydrators, so we're not doing it anymore. But people, I mean, not people, but their dogs loved them. Um, but, and they're super healthy. We didn't add anything. We just dehydrated the skins of the fish and cut them into little strips and sold them. Um, so that was a good way to reduce waste. That's, yeah, that's really clever. And yeah, most dogs I know in Alaska love love the skins. And I'll also say, yeah, salmon bellies are hard to find outside of Alaska because I think Alaskans eat a lot of them. They're, they're <laughs> the best part. Um, one, another follow-up question for you, Kayla, is, you know, you've mentioned, you just mentioned Yakobi Fisheries out of Southeast Alaska and sourcing from other fishermen and fisheries of, around the country. Could you share a little bit about, you know, how guys, did you guys decide what products um, you were gonna source and who you were gonna source from? And, you know, how did you build that network of other fishermen that you trusted um, both in, you know, their sustainability, but also quality? Um, and, and could you touch on, on that a little bit? Yeah, so um, we worked with a handful of different fishermen and um, one of their fishermen and uh, catches salmon and um, we knew for a long time we wanted to offer a salmon product we get asked for salmon all the time and in New England it really is mostly just farm-raised salmon available 
but we wanted to have like the highest quality wild salmon because we knew that you could, um, you know, go to Whole Foods and get whatever salmon they have that's wild, but it's probably not the best quality. Um, and we wanted to be different and also support like independent fishermen and their families. So uh, a big part of that connection was the local catch network. And Tim has been a part of the local catch network for years and years. And he knew quite a few salmon fishermen through those conferences, as well as Lance um, from Anna Marie Shrimp. He's in local catch too. So we already had these connections. We just didn't have like the ability to get the product here from out there and having like a processing plant, we were able to finally um, logistically put it together and get their stuff sh um, shipped to us. And they also buy some of our products to like our scallops as well. So it's been a really cool partnership and our customers really like to hear the story and know that this fish was caught by our friends in Alaska and we're not like taking credit for the quality because it's the fishermen, the salmon fishermen who are putting like their lives into this work and they're catching the fish with like a rock or hook and line and bleeding them and brining them. So they're taking care of the fish the way we take our, care of our fish, but we're letting like their story shine through, um, which I think people really appreciate um, the traceability and knowing that it's not just like your average piece of wild salmon from the supermarket. So it's all flash frozen too and like really well taken care of. So we've been really happy with the partnership and um, I think our customer base is like, can't go without the salmon now <laughs> every week they're asking for it, so. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and it looks like based on the chat, you know, we've got some fishermen here who, you know, it sounds like maybe you have sold some of their fish through Yacobi. So it's just awesome, the interconnectedness here and great to hear, you know, that local things like local catch network, you know, that network is actually working um, and helping fishermen and seafood suppliers, you know, find each other and work with each other. So it's really awesome to see that actually play out in a real way. Um, okay, we're going to do just a couple more questions for you guys. I'm going to hand it over to Sarah, and she is going to um, ask you guys to expand on some of this stuff. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, really interesting and inspiring businesses that you ladies have and the folks that you work with. Kayla, you mentioned that as part of your pivot this year and all the work you've done to do pop-ups and processing and to work on this really in-depth HASA plan, and I'm wondering, um, were there any challenges in that? Um, I, I know I've spoken with folks in Rhode Island and I know in San Diego, um, sometimes complying with uh, local regulations and how they're in, they interpret federal regulations can be challenging for the way fishermen operate. So in addition to a very lengthy um, HACCP plan that you had to Put together were there any were there any other specific challenges that you had to figure out and and maybe get more information from your local um, the local rule makers the local health and safety uh, that local health and safety people from the county I, I think this was um, a hot topic in um, in uh, the marketplace of ideas yesterday and I think maybe there was some interest in and a little bit more on that. So I'm wondering if you could speak to that at all. Yeah, definitely. Um, we had a lot of help from the state of New Hampshire, um, like the food inspection. And there was one woman who really helped me through like the getting our application in to become like a seafood processing plant. And honestly, this past year, I have had to step back from fishing quite a bit. Um, because I'm managing all of this on land and I, I have not fished like much because of this. Um, and it's been, there's a huge learning curve and I've bought, I've, um, I ordered a guide. It was called the direct marketing guide for 
for for fishermen or something from Sea Grant in Alaska. That helped quite a bit. Um, like a step by step guide on how to sell your catch directly, um, and also a lot of information that help that's really helpful in putting together a HAZA plan, but also working with like your local and state and your federal government um, to get all of your inspections together and your health licenses to operate a processing plan. Um, it's definitely complex. And uh, we also work in three different states too. So we have to deal with mm. Mass, New Hampshire, and Maine to get all certified to sell seafood in all three states. So that was like another level of complexity. Wow, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, it's, there's a price tag on like every health license to get. So it's, it's pretty costly. Um, like the beginning of the year, it's like thousands of dollars to just be able to sell our fish at a farmer's market because you have to um, get all these different certifications and all of our like refrigerated vehicles are considered facilities. They're mm -hmm. extra facilities. So those to be inspected as well. Um, so there, there's a lot that goes into it, but if there was anyone who was interested in starting like a small processing plan, I would definitely like talk to them um, about it and help them through as fast as I can, because to, I mean, I knew a little bit going into it, but it's like a whole can of worms that once you start, um, there's just a ton of regulations on seafood processing and like the type of packaging you can and can't use. Mm -hmm. um, and like every day you have to fill out like multiple forms, like for regarding like the sanitation of your facility, make sure that all of your employees are trained. And I basically like quiz our employees once a month about food safety, even though like the farmer's market kids, like they don't really do processing, but they're still like in the processing plan on the weekends, getting ready for farmer's markets and they're handling the product. So it's important that they know. Um, so it's, it's pretty extensive. Yeah, it sounds like there's um, a big financial cost as well as a time cost mm -hmm. for all of these things. Yeah. And what I'm hearing is that um, connections, you know, being connected to the right people, either through mm -hmm. these types of slow fish, local catch networks, that sort of thing, and with the people who actually are, are monitoring to make sure the rules are followed. Mm -hmm. uh, Jordan, I, I want to kind of bring this to you too. Um, and I'm thinking of, I, I, I thought of this because I was talking to a colleague in Rhode Island some time ago, and I know the fishermen there, they were subject to different rules that we were subject to in San Diego about being able to sell directly off their boat. They had to do it, I think, within 24 hours um, in order to be able to do sell. But, you know, that's not, that rule is interpreted differently by different states, I understand. And and I'm just wondering, I know with the market itself, um, the creation of it, those health and safety rules were a, a big consideration. And maybe with COVID this year, maybe there were some added um, health and safety issues that you guys had to address. I'm just wondering if you have anything that you want to share about this topic. Yeah. Um, so I remember being part of this, that email chain with the 24 hours and that kind of blew my mind. But um, with the market when we started six years ago the fishermen were selling just once a week like off the boat and kind of realized that there was more of a demand and so um, pete Helmy and a couple other people went to i believe the city um and then to the port and then i believe it was also through the state and so it was i came in a few weeks in so i like kind of missed part of their process with what happened um but they went um, and created the Pacific to plate bill, which allowed open air seafood markets because under farmers markets, because it wasn't um, produce, it wasn't agriculture, it was fish, which I also, when I was, I think it was four years ago, I put myself into a farmer's market and had the same issue. People were asking like where my commissary was and where we kept, like where we were getting the fish from. And I wanted to just, you know, make it very blunt and say that it was coming from the ocean. You know, we weren't getting it from anywhere else. And for whatever reason, it was really hard for people to understand that, that we weren't sourcing from anywhere else but ourselves. And so with the passing of the Pacific to plate bill, we were able to start Tuna Harbor Dockside Market. And so it allowed kind of an umbrella 
permit to the fishermen and the market to be able to sell their produce. Um, I'm sorry, not their produce, their fish through um, the market on Saturdays. And so, especially with COVID, we had to kind of alter and follow whatever new guidelines were coming out. And so it went from pe people being able to like touch the fish and really interact with the um, fish to having to go directly through the fishermen or the, the wives, the daughters, the sons that were helping and say, this is, I'd like to look at this fish and they would have to be the ones handling everything. Everyone has to wear masks. Um, people, the fishermen will wear gloves as they're handling fish. And so it was a, it was a big adjustment, I think for us, not so much the consumer because they were okay either way, not having to touch the fish before they were, they left the market. Um, but the Pacific to plate bill is what allowed us to operate on a weekly basis. Um, under the, again, I'm not sure the specifics of the, the bill because it was a few weeks before I entered the, the process, but that is how we are able to operate on a Saturday. And then we've just kind of rolled with the punches as COVID has continued to throw things our way in the last year, but we've been able to meet every new regulation um, and pass with flying colors. So. so maybe in the case of Tuna Harbor, what empowered your community was being connected with um, I think it was the county that authored, initially authored that bill, connecting with the folks in in the county that were that had that ability to update the California Health and Safety Code. Um, and I, and I, my understanding is over time, having that interaction with the county probably was all. I wonder if it was also helpful during you know, with the onset of COVID, the pandemic and these new regulations, you guys had a, a history of compliance and doing the right thing. So, and you probably had some connections with them already. So I wonder if that was also a benefit. Yeah, I think that definitely helped us in the long run that we had been in good standing for six years. <laughs> Thank you guys, ladies. So I think um, just one last question, and then we're going to actually do an intro for our third speaker who's here but not here. Um, Jordan, we, we're getting a lot of interest and intrigue with your curriculum, um, your education program, and wondering if you could share a little bit more about the education program model um, that you've been working on and any advice you might have for others that are interested in, in working with schools and creating education programs. and curriculum yeah so we had actually done our first like in classroom program um, in February of 2020 and so the following month is when everything shut down and so we only got to do one but it was it was a really neat experience for me because I wanted to be a teacher before I kind of switched to the whole I've always been into fishing but for a long time I wanted to be a teacher and so I reached out to my first grade teacher who had, I had actually shadowed um, my senior year of high school and I had said she I'd, I had kept in touch with her over the years and so I kind of mentioned what we were doing and amongst all the things I do sometimes I also substitute teach at an elementary school because my mom works at the school and so I would see her regularly and kind of keep up with what I was doing and I had mentioned to her that we were putting together a program to try to get kids better connected and more versed in just seafood and the ocean in general. And so she was all for it. And I went in with myself um, and one of the other ladies on our slow food board. She met me in there and for an hour on a Friday, I took in local species that were, um, some lobsters were in season. I got some urchin from one of our divers and kelp and just like small things that the kids could kind of interact with and touch and see that the ocean wasn't all big and scary. And so, we took in, a, or I had put together a PowerPoint, and so we went through our PowerPoint, talked about um, the ocean, talked about just fishing in general, kind of relating it to first graders, you know, asking who had been to the beach and who had consumed fish and stuff like that. And so we then had our um, show and tell portion, I guess, which would be when they kind of got to interact with everything. And then they did um, a coloring um activity afterwards that, to relate to what they had seen during the presentation. And then the, um, Ms. Farrell was her name. So Ms. Farrell actually a few weeks later they had done for back to school night, 
she had given them the option to pick between two different presenters that they had had during the year. And a, a majority of the kids drew pictures of um, the seafood. And when I would go in as a substitute, like weeks, months later, they would have little um, like shapes that they would be putting together just like as a free time activity. And they would always be making crabs with these shapes and be like, Miss Jordan, like what we're doing, we learned this from you and they have this many legs. And so it was really nice to see that they were able to carry with them what they had learned because at six, seven years old as a first grader, it's not something that a lot of people could retain uh, long-term. And so our plan was to continue through the elementary school, kind of do like once a month, if not once a week with different grade levels. Mm -hmm. So that is on pause right now, but we've kind of shifted to doing what we're, we've deemed kits for kids which is gonna be all the materials that we had um, allotted for these education programs. We're gonna, we're in the process of putting them together to take to shelters and YMCAs and schools that are doing um, like half on campus, half at home again still. And so that's kind of how we've had to switch that in the last year, but still being able to give kids the materials to be more comfortable with local stuff. And so we, um, through, I believe it's, um, actually I can't think of a website on, online, but we got, we're going to get like little um, growable fish where you can put them in water and the, over a couple of days they expand into larger size and stickers and stuff that they are able to remember what they've learned or have not learned if we haven't worked with those kids. Um, so that's been our biggest like shift, but that's what we had um, developed before COVID kind of shut us down. That's great. And another short answer. <laughs> no, that's really inspiring and sounds really fun too. And obviously it's sticking, you know, just the fact like it's resonating what you guys shared. Um, that's great. And I know we're going to get into in the second um, cluster of storytellers, we'll be hearing a lot more about educating the next generation of seafood, seafood consumers and also seafood stewards. But um, thanks for sharing your experience there. Um, so we're going to wrap up this initial storytelling section um, with our, our third storyteller who unfortunately was unable to be here, um, but I, I think for reasons you all can understand and relate to. Um, her name is Anna Shellam from Shellam Seafood in North Carolina, um, and she wasn't able to make it today last minute um, because of changes in weather and tides and her really complicated seafood delivery um, schedule. So, you know, we're disappointed she can't be here, but she was able to um, share with us her story through a video. So we're going to watch just a short four minute video um, that gives a little more about her story and, you know, how, how she's bringing local seafood to her local community. So. So we're going to transition now into a little more discussion. And again, like I said before, we're going to open up our circle a bit and bring in some, some new voices um, just to share a little bit about their stories and their businesses um, and you know, talk about where they see overlap in some of the stories we just heard um, and what they can relate to. So first, we're going to hear from Steve Curian with Wild for Salmon and Pride of Bristol Bay. I'll give Steve a minute to join us here. Hello. Hi, Steve. How um, are you? Doing great. Uh, we're gonna just, I'm gonna let you introduce yourself and you know share a little bit about your story and also your businesses. And because I know they're both quite different and maybe a little bit about how they, they both work and how you're bringing seafood to consumers all over the country. Great. Yeah, I'm Steve Curian. Uh, based in Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania, born and raised. And um, after graduating college, I went to Alaska um, on a whim to do some salmon fishing just for fun. And um, from that trip, I started to flay my own fish on the beach and bring them back home with me. My father was a custom butcher. So I kind of had that in my blood and uh, brought some fish home. And it um, took it to a local farmer's market on a request, just kind of like, it was silly to me. Um, and listening to the other speakers, like you can see how all these um, stories start where you're just kind of like doing what you love, following a passion. And um, you find out that people are really craving wild, sustainable seafood um, direct from the source. 
and um my my wife now girlfriend then um went up and fished with me for the first eight years in bristol bay and we just started bringing salmon back and um the second year we started wild four salmon which was just um farmers market based wild alaskan sockeye and from there we took it to um pairing up with some other alaskan fishermen to bring back halibut and black cod um which started out with a fisherman by the name of Chris McDowell, which is now um, part of Yukobi Fisheries, which we've heard that name. Um, so we work with those guys for pretty much the last 16 years, I'd say, and um, to get the fish from Southeast Alaska. And um, through that process, like, we really got to, to see this niche grow. And I'm so excited to be part of this conversation because I think there's still a ton of opportunity in all of the different fisheries to bring your product to market at some scale or at whatever scale you would want to bring it to the marketplace because um, everybody has different kind of business desires and and how much of an impact they want to make and what's comfortable for them and I think it's okay to play any part of that in the um, process of bringing wild sustainable seafood to consumers um, and then we've kind of continued to grow wild for salmon to an online um, we, what we thought of as a regional business covering half of the country because of because of kind of shipping um, levels different different levels of of where we can reach from Bloomsburg and um, we have a brick and mortar store that's been doing really well and we're going to be doing some expansion there. So our, our local fan base is really strong and we're starting to kind of really grow that closer to a more of a national scale. And that's pretty exciting. So, I mean, after this will be our, our 18th year with Wild for Salmon. So um, we're starting to get some really good traction. And uh, two years ago, a good friend of mine who I helped start or not help start, I gave him a lot of good information to kind of get Proud of Bristol Bay off the ground, which was the a business we ended up buying. Was the model was based on having um, twenty pound cases ship three, so you could have national distribution and really kind of get Bristol Bay sockeye all over the country. And so, um, my good friend Matt Luck started that, and then we took it over to kind of get our focus back on strictly Bristol Bay sockeye in bulk, um, 10 or 20 pound cases is what it is now. And so we've got kind of two different business models. One allows us to have a really national imprint or footprint with um, wild sockeye and then wild for salmon is more of a regional with all different sales channels of wholesale, online, brick and mortar, and we still do the farmer's markets. So um, it's quite, complex i guess to have both businesses but i'm so passionate about getting wild seafood to the consumer that it just makes it all the more fun and if that makes sense absolutely well and i you know steve your story is is quite different from the the stories we just heard because you're not fishing in your local waters right you know your fishery is thousands of miles away and a lot of the fish you source is coming from thousands of miles away so how do you define there's a lot of talk about eating local seafood and eating local food like how do you define local and what does that conversation look like with your customers and you know how are you helping build that relationship to where people's fish is coming from even if it might be from across the other side of the continent yeah um I just had this conversation with Scott Steen, a slow food chapter leader in Jackson Hole um, that we work with. And, um, you know, I, I don't, it, it originally started, you know, 10 years ago where it was like everything had to be within five miles of where you're, where you're living, you should be buying your food from. But I think that's really kind of changed now. And it's more about knowing who harvested your food and how you can trust it, trust that source, because you're not going to find salmon anywhere else but Alaska in the Pacific Northwest. So for the people all over the country that can't access that because they don't live close to it, 
um, but yet still want to enjoy that wild resource um, for both, you know, the taste and the health benefits. Um, s buying models like mine and a bunch of the others we heard from um, Kaylee, I believe, said that, you know, they're really starting to sell more salmon in New England. So there's a demand for it. And I think the part that we need to focus on is making sure that the traceability is there and the quality is there and that it's being sourced from the proper kind of fisheries for sustainability wise. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, no, and I, I think seafood is, it's complex. And, um, you know, for those of you in the audience, you know, who do live in a landlocked state, you know, and you're wondering, okay, well, where do I get local seafood? I mean, Steve's a great example of what's available and things like the local catch network, you know, have ways where you can search for, you know, seafood suppliers that are um, values-based and community-based all over the country. So lots of good resources out there online about how to get local seafood wherever, wherever you might live. Um, great. See, we've gotten some questions here in the chat about, you know, farmer's markets. And I think for folks, um, you know, building their business, you're kind of weighing costs and benefits and time costs and benefits of venturing into different market spaces. Um, could you expand a little bit on your experience and working in farmer's markets and what, you know, was that productive for you all? Um, and what did that, what did that look like? Yeah, I mean, I think the farmer's markets was really gave us um, a super strong foundation in our local community and it gave us the understanding of what the customer wanted. So, you know, even when I take that back to Bristol Bay and I'm talking to other fishermen about quality, like one thing I've learned over the years is, and this has changed a bit, but when I first started fishing Bristol Bay, it was really hard to get fishermen on board with quality. Now that's changed, like I said, but when you actually have to hand Elizabeth a salmon on Saturday and say, here, you know, here's your salmon and take the money for it, you realize the importance of quality and how important it is to make sure that that supply chain is matched and, and the customer is getting what they want. So I think it was um, the backbone of our business was kind of like started there around the farmer's markets. And from there, then it allow us to kind of grow to a brick and mortar store and um, online. And then and we've actually kind of pulled back from some of the farmer's markets during COVID. And it'll be interesting to see, um, we're kind of like going back at a monthly guest vendor um, approach this spring to see how, how that works. But, um, and that was kind of a decision we made you know, when COVID just broke and, and we felt that it was important to protect our, our staff from being out and about. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I think that that's a great place to start any small business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, any business, business of any kind. Um, one last question for you, Steve. You know, lots of folks are wondering about uh, packaging. And, you know, it's not just about having sustainable fish, but also thinking about how to have more environmentally friendly packaging. How have you guys navigated that? And, and what have you found any, you know, magic uh, packaging, especially for frozen seafood where, you know, vacuum sealed is so, so important? Yeah, I mean, I don't think at this point in time, there is a magic bullet for it. And I mean, it is probably out of the whole model, the whole business model, that's the piece that um, I'm not proud of one bit is the, you know, the use of plastic. So we try to, you know, minimize it for one, but I was on a call and I, and I just a little bit ago, um, and they were talking about how they were taking the H and G fish and, and keeping them frozen until they needed them, slacking them out, flaying them, and then glazing them and just selling the glazed product um, unpackaged. And that really caught my attention. And so, um, I haven't started to do any kind of experimenting with it, but it's an interesting thought process um, as technology has changed and what used to be, you know, a twice frozen product that was glazed was maybe not as good as a vac packed filet. Um, I think it's that that window is, is getting closer to, or, you know, narrower um, and those products are getting closer in quality. So, I'm thinking that there, you know, there could be some kind of slick ways to develop 
you know, some packaging within glaze or glaze product within mm -hmm. packaging and really kind of shrink the plastic, but I don't think you'll get away from it. Mm -hmm. No, well, I know it's a, it's a question without an easy answer. And, you know, as we maybe something to think about as we go into our breakouts, you know, our hope is that's, you know, together we can figure out maybe what some of the answers to these questions and challenges are that a lot of us are facing um, and wondering. So we're gonna do one more question. Um, Sarah, I will let you take take this one and then we'll we'll go into our breakouts. Thanks for that, uh, Steve. I, uh, that packaging thing I know is a challenge. I know um, one of the CSFs in San Francisco transitioned to a more sustainable one and I, and this long answer, short answer is just much more expensive. Um, and I, you know, Jordan can probably tell you who it is, but there was a fella at Tuna Harmer that was selling headed and gutted uh, frozen salmon that had been glazed on the ship. And I can attest that they were quite, quite delicious. Um, but the, the question I had was back to something you mentioned, you mentioned about transitioning from the farmer's market to brick and mortar. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak to that and what that looked like for you and any any lessons learned you would want to share with folks that might be interested in that. Yeah, I mean, the transition we were, I mean, it was kind of funny. We, I think the last year that we were working out of our house and some freezers um, that were in our, our garage and a little freezer truck and a trailer with a freezer in it, we had sold like 30,000 pounds of salmon through the basement of our garage of our house. So like we had realized we needed to um, move into a brick and mortar and we just opened up real small and like it was just a couple chest freezers. And because we were doing the farmer's markets, we were also using the space to help organize the rest of the, you know, the farmer's market side of stuff. and we're looking for storage. So we just opened up a small, it was like, um, it was maybe 10 by 12 room in the front of the building that we had purchased. And um, people, one of the things that I always remember is I was out fixing the driveway because it was a dirt driveway um, on the property that we just bought. And so I'm out there like preparing it and like feeling guilty that it wasn't perfect. And a lady was walking in and she's like, we're not coming here for the, you know, for the blacktop we're coming for the quality of the fish. And so I think what that taught me was, is like, I didn't have to go out and spend a ton of money to have this great store space because people trusted the quality of fish that we were bringing back in the service that we were offering. And then that just built the business um, from there. And I still think that's true. You know, we haven't, we're going to do a little bit of a remodel coming up, but we've not put a ton of money into that and have just got very simple cases um, you know, we're in rural Pennsylvania. It's not like we're in a wealthy part of the state, but people have over the years, they really come to understand who we are, what our values are and the quality. And it just continues to build and build and build because of that. So I think, you know, opening up on whatever budget you can is, is wise. And then if you follow your, your beliefs on, the quality customer service and you know just really wanting to get your customers the best seafood they can have it like just builds from there thanks for that yeah yeah i mean a, a, a word and a theme here that's definitely coming up a lot is trust right and and trust between fishermen working together but really trust between you and your customers and both quality and traceability and um, just really I feel like that's the linchpin to, to all of us. Um, so we've got Lance joining us. Hi Lance, welcome. Um, just I'm going to let you do a quick introduction of yourself Lance and Anna Marie Seafoods if that's okay. I know a lot of folks know you and your story but it would be great to um, yeah just have you do a quick quick intro and then I know we've got some some good questions here for you. I'm uh, Lance Nasio, uh, third generation fisherman from South Louisiana. Uh, I have a pretty unique operation. I have three boats. So one's a 65 foot shrimp boat, has a plate freezer on it. The other is a 60 foot reef fish boat where we fish offshore reef fish. And another one is a 40 foot inshore uh, shrimp boat. 
and we unload our own products. We sell our own stuff. We have a little microprocessing uh, facility. Uh, you know, we've been doing it since 97 and uh, been in some farmer's markets for probably about 18 years. Uh, we do in 12 a month right now. And uh, we have customers and well networked throughout the U.S. So uh, was, was a big part of Slow Food uh, for many, many years. Was a delegate twice to Terra Madre in Italy. Uh, was asked to participate in the COPA 13 conference in uh, Cancun a few years ago and kind of give some young fishermen uh, ideas on how to improve their business and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, we've been well recognized and, and been around quite a bit and uh, created a customer base with our products and the quality of our products to, you know, that we have a demand that we work, uh, you know, five to seven days a week, uh, just trying to fulfill the the demands we've created and uh, you know we work uh, closely with Sea Grant and uh, we've worked quite a bit on helping other fishermen figure out ways and avenues to to you know market their products and, and do for themselves and, and become more sustainable in their fisheries and and create these value-added products I mean we have some you know we're second in um, seafood volume here in Louisiana uh, production but you know we don't always take the best care of it or you know, a lot of the industry is just doing it the way it's always been done. And, and we've taken a lot of steps and, and, you know, created some examples for other fishermen to follow and it's happening. And, and, you know, Sea Grant's a big part of us helping facilitate all this stuff. That's great. Um, thank you for that. And there's a, a few things um, I'd love to dig into a little deeper. You mentioned, I mean, I, I think it's clear you're, you're really one of the the lead innovators, you know, in your your fishery, your community. Could you speak to, um, you know, when it comes to investing in just some of the infrastructure that's, you know, wasn't there before to help you produce the high quality um, that you want to bring to your customers? What have some of those investments been like? Um, some of the, the challenges with those investments and, you know, what's worked well as far as where you've put your money and new gear or new technology? Well, you know, any investment is risky because you're not sure of the outcome. But, uh, you know, I was fortunate along the way to land some pretty good deals that kind of helped me financially back some of this. So uh, early on in my career, uh, they were offering fishermen space to sell their products in front of some grocery stores here locally. And I took a chance and went and made a deal with the, uh, the PR guy that they wanted to start carrying head on shrimp in their stores. And uh, for five years, I was their shrimp guy. I started out with this um, grocery store chain. They had 11 stores and it was all manageable. And as the years passed, they continually grew. And uh, I kind of removed myself from them after about five years because they brought in new management and they were, you know, buying shrimp wherever they can find it because this thing grew beyond the capacity that I can fulfill. And they were buying shrimp and using the pictures of my boat to sell. And, you know, it got as bad as they were selling farm-raised shrimp with my picture of my boat there. And, you know, people were looking out for me and they called me and I just kind of told them to quit using my image and, and just kind of separated from them. But, you know, they were a catalyst in helping me get to the place I am now because, you know, I mean, it was a steady gig. It was a lot of volume and, uh, you know, it, it just helped me to make these investments and open my eyes to the possibilities. And, uh, you know, we still sell them shrimp from time to time, but it's it's on my terms. It's when we have an overflow of inventory here, you know, we sell to them. But, uh, you know, they were a great help in getting me started. And then, you know, we did some guerrilla marketing with a, a group out of New Orleans called uh, Market Umbrella. Uh, we did a tour called the White Boot Brigade where we took fishermen and went to New York. We won the Today Show. We did, you know, some really cool stuff, brought our, our product there. Then we went to California and uh, I was in William Sonoma's catalog in 2006 because we did a demo at their flagship store and they wanted to sell my product. So, you know, we had some, some, some lots of exposure and, and just doing all these things kind of made me feel more comfortable with crazy, uh, you know, thoughts and investments and, uh, some of the better investments I made was uh, we built a storage freezer and we got a forklift and pallet jack and all the stuff to move 
when we first started, uh, when we put a plate freezer on the boat, everything was done by hand. We had to load each box in the truck by hand, and we had to unload it and into a freezer all by hand. So, uh, you know, when we had opportunity to upgrade our equipment, we we got a, a much bigger freezer, and we got a forklift and a pallet jack, and you know, we took out some of the manual parts of of the business and. Probably, I don't know, about 15 years ago, we built a little processing facility, and uh, it's just a little microprocessing room. It's not a big room. It's uh, it's Board of Health approved. Um, you know, it did HACCP training, and you know that that really allowed us to be a lot more creative with the things that we're doing here. And um, you know, we cut fish and vacuum sealed fish uh, for our farmers markets. It started out for our farmers markets, the need for this process room, but uh, it's grown beyond that. You know, we uh, we cut fish and we peel shrimp probably three days a week. I have ladies that come in and, and do stuff for us. So you know, we produce a high quality product. It costs me a little more to produce it because I pay them fair and you know. Um, quality at the end of the day it's 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 what sells us so we try not to stray from the quality aspects of it so you know the processing room was one of my biggest uh, improvements should i say and then all the pieces of the puzzle that it took to get there and um it was it was quite pricey but you know it was a tragedy when it happened but it was a blessing also is uh when the bp oil spill happened uh, you know, I got on board and worked for uh, five months and uh, the pay was nothing like a fisherman could ever expect because it was getting a, a tremendous day rate and all of our operating expenses were paid. So uh, what I did is I took a lot of that money and reinvested it into the business. And that's where we got the bigger freezer, the park lift and, you know, all these these pieces of the puzzle that were missing to make our operation more efficient. So, you know, it just... And, and we're still investing. I mean, we're steadily investing. I, I kind of outdrew the processing facility and uh, I bought some property next to me a couple of years ago and then building it up, fixing it and a plan on and doing something on a little larger scale there where we can handle some, you know, more of the opportunities that are put in front of us. So right now we're kind of at capacity with, you know, the size facility we have and, and the amount of people we can get to work in there. So. And so, uh, you know, it seems like you're always reinvesting, you know, but, uh, you know, investment brings opportunity and, and that's the way we look at it here. Yeah, I think that's that's exactly right. And it's, yeah, I mean, it's been years of investment and reinvestment too, as, as you explained. We're going to have uh, one of the facilitators from each of the breakout rooms is going to just share some notes some highlights from their discussion, some of the questions and themes that came up. And then after everyone's had a chance to do that, then we'll kind of open it back up for questions from all of you, um, you know, questions that emerged in your breakout or questions um, that you might have for some of the storytellers and thought leaders that we've heard from so far. Um, and then again, we're gonna take a little break and transition um, and Sarah will lead us through our next set of, of stories, so. Awesome. Well, I'm just going to go down the lineup of um, the jam boards and call on a thought leader from each of those to, again, just a quick rundown of what you guys discussed, what came up. Um, so we're going to start with, let's start with monkfish um, with Jared and Jenny. If one of you, hopefully this works, um, hopefully should be able to join us. Hi guys. Um, what we talked about is sort of demystifying the fear of whole fish and how we can actually get customers, whether it be restaurants or home um, cooks or even kids here at school, to um, try new cuts of fish or shellfish um, and just the ways that we can um, give knowledge, but in a sort of easy, accessible way um, to continue the conversation about how am amazing it is to eat the whole fish and some of the quote unquote weirder cuts of fish. It was a magical conversation actually. That's great. Yeah, your jam board, it looks like there's a lot of good, good stuff and good ideas up there. Would you say that you guys came out of it with a sense of 
uh, maybe a next step or, you know, for slow fish, slow food to take collectively to, to explore this topic more? I, I think one of the things um, I personally took was um, I learned that um, my brain sort of popped when I realized that I could have tangible um, fish cut cards that I could share with my students and then in turn share with families. Um, so having that tangible sort of visual, beautiful artwork that will say this is the cut of fish and a specific fish to push those boundaries was really mind blowing for me. Um, I think that also we shared that there are ways to um, maybe give samples to restaurants or even to um, customers in your um, fish shop so that the people that would not necessarily buy that cut of fish would then be like, not, you know, not be afraid to spend that dollar, but take it home, try it, use it to their, um, for their clients in their restaurants and so forth. So I think, um, you know, utilizing the fair, clean and good food that Slow Food stands for, I think we came out with some really good um, solutions that we can start to move forward with. That's awesome. That's impressive. And short amount of time. That's great. You guys came up with that. Thank you. Um, and for others who were in the monkfish room, feel free in the chat section, you know, if there were things that grabbed you or really resonated, feel free to add that there um, as well. Um, so we're going to go to Pollock, the Pollock room, which was with Andrea and Jordan, if one of you is able to give us a little readout on your discussion. Hey, everybody. Uh, Jordan had to go. She had a dog issue. We have three dogs to knock guys. We had about 12 people. Um, we first started out with very organic uh, discussion. Sarah Curry from down in Miami was discussing supply chain issues. She works with some restaurants down in Miami. And I mentioned that I'd done some work um, investigating CSFs down in Florida and how there are absolutely, absolutely none in Florida, so to speak of. If you look at local catch and you, you know, search the, the state of Florida, you really don't see many. Um, that's something she said she was definitely aware of. Um, then we discussed the really successful transition of the monkfish fishery over to the clam fishery. Cedar Key in Florida happens to be the capital of that success story. And Sarah actually has a video that I think she's going to be able to present during this slow fish virtual gathering um, on that story. I personally witnessed um, what was going on in Cedar Key last year. It was very inspirational to see one very dead industry, uh, monkfish staining transferring over to a really successful clam fishery with a lot of equity. So there are a lot of people of color in that industry and a lot of younger, um, low-income folk. So that was great. We discussed how we, um, there's a lot of ma and pa spat shops that are part of that really successful clam fishery where people of a lower income category are able to do their own spat shop literally right out in their backyard and sell spat to these, to these clam fishermen. So that was great. As you can see, we were kind of tangenting all over the place with this, the discussion. Um, and then we got into, I was um, wondering from Kaylin from BC with the young fishermen, how the succession looks in um, Canada for, succession is a tricky word. When I first heard it, I didn't quite understand it. Succession just meaning that, you know, your grandfather has passed down his boat to you and then your dad has passed down his boat to you. succession meaning younger generations are getting into the fishing industry based on what their family did and um, certainly in New England we've seen a real decrease in succession over the past 20 years and you know to my surprise Cameron said she's seen the same thing in BC as well mm -hmm. so I think this grain of the fleet issue is not just national but it's an international dilemma. I've seen it in Jamaica in the fishing industry that I work with on the South Coast as well. And I think it's a it's a real concern yeah. to have succession happening within our fishing industry. And our time kind of ran up right around there. Unless Jordan, you had something else to add. Um, well, gosh, I mean, you guys hit the big one. And it, I think it's definitely one we'll dig into in the next series of stories. Thank you, guys is equity, right? And so equity um, between generations, um, you know, equity, just financial equity, equity access to fish, access to fishing permits, you know, and the capital to invest in fisheries. So I, I'm just really glad you guys dug into that one because it's really, it's really key and it's a big one that is international um, and, and one for us to dig into more, a lot more. So thank you. Thanks for sharing. 
Um, next, we're going to go to the shrimp room with Lance and Kayla. One of you wants to give us a little quick update on what you all covered. So you're good. Um, and we've got Kayla too. So great. So yeah, if, if one of you or both of you wants to share just some of the themes and um, next, you know, action items or questions that emerged in your, your breakout discussion. Well, you know, some of the questions that were asked was, uh, you know, about the processing uh, that we do and uh, kind of did a little walkthrough of our processing facility. It's uh, not nothing extravagant. It's a room, it's a, just a cinder block uh, room that's uh, probably 14 by 10. And uh, we have stainless steel tables and three compartment sink and commercial vacuum packer. So, I mean, we have everything it takes to be DHH approved. And then, you know, some other things we talked about was uh, logistics of uh, frozen frozen product being shipped. And, uh, you know, we've been selling them some stuff and uh, bringing it through air freight, but uh, the most efficient way of doing it is, uh, you know, building a pallet and putting it on a truck and, and sending it because the cost of, uh, by doing air freight, Dollar twenty a pound, but if we do it on a truck, we're looking at probably thirty to fifty cents a pound on, on a bigger amount. So I mean, there's better ways of doing it. Just uh, you know, she was saying they don't have a storage freezer big enough to take in a pallet yet. They don't have a forklift. So you know, these are all some things that uh, it took many years for us to to get these things. But it's all things you need to move towards to be able to to work more efficiently and more cost effectively you know, is, is getting these pieces of the puzzle in place. And, uh, you know, as a small business owner, you have a lot of things pulling at you. And, you know, I have three boats that I try to keep up and, you know, no matter how good you try to keep them up, they're always needing something. And, you know, it's, it's just about weighing everything out. So uh, it's about five years now that I got off of my boat. And before I was, when I was running the boat and trying to run everything else, it was very difficult because, you know, I needed to spend the time out at sea, but then I needed the time on land to build a, the wholesale business. And probably about five years ago, my son, he, he took over the captain's position on the boat and uh, I started staying on shore and, uh, you know, it made things a whole lot easier when you, you got someone who, you know, is managing it for you. Cause a lot of what we do is, is managing the logistics of the business and, you know, that that's the wholesale side of it is a whole different animal in itself. You know, uh, we do it in 12 farmers markets a month. We, you know, send pallets of stuff out. We service a lot of local uh, places here in the Homa, New Orleans area, you know, where we make deliveries once or twice a week. So, you know, and it's just, it's just two of us really that's running the operation, me and my nephew here. And then we bring in some ladies that do, you know, some of the processing for us. So, probably about three times a week we're processing shrimp or fish. So, uh, you know, we, we, we stay busy at it, you know, and that's what it takes when you're a small business, you know, you need to put in that effort. And, you know, a lot of times I'll get calls in the evenings, at night, weekends, and, you know, we feel obligated that we need to take care of these customers and, and that's what we do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, I bet a lot of folks on, on, joining us today can relate to a lot of what you said of just wearing lots of hats simultaneously lack of time and how to manage that time and also how to manage others and your a team and a team that you trust and can depend on is really key um kayla did you have anything to to add to that from from the discussion or i think on all the major points um uh, i think a lot of the are um, similar with like all small business owners that are just starting out like major hurdles that you face but you like really care about what you're trying to do so you just do it and you don't think about it and um yeah we're just keeping keeping going and this time last year tim and i were in definitely a different position um we've come really far so we're pretty proud of what we have going on and our connections with Lance and Jacoby and the other fishermen that we work with. Um, we're ha happy that we're, we're building kind of like a fisherman's guild almost where like fishermen who are selling direct to consumers can like work together um, to like broaden their horizons and overcome these obstacles.
That's, I think that's a really great takeaway and something, you know, I, I yeah, I, I think that's one of the big key themes and maybe takeaways from this whole discussion is how, you know, we can't all do it by ourselves um, and, and working together and finding ways to do that. And, and the fact you guys are doing that through your businesses, working together formally, I think is a really exciting model and um, an opportunity to, to explore new, new ways of, yeah, sort of congregating, aggregating um, together. So um, we'll move on to the salmon room just to keep being sensitive of time here. Um, so Steve or Marsh, do you guys wanna share with us some of the things that your group covered? Sure. Um, we continued on with the plastics topic. So um, we kind of discussion on ways to cut plastic and, you know, obviously with the vacuum sealed product and that being first and foremost, getting the customer the best product possible. We uh, kind of talked about that and then just the difference between the pouch and the roll stock machines. Um, maybe the first step would be looking for opportunity just to save um, some percentage of plastic. And then um, we had a little bit of discussion on, you know, experimental stuff, the plant-based, um, and that led over into packaging material and um, sharing some ideas there. Um, so Jared was also in the room from Red's Best and he was talking about styrofoam. So um, for fresh fish shipping, so if anybody has any ideas, um, how to, how to move away from styrofoam, that'd be interesting. We don't use styrofoam, so um, send in frozen product. So that wasn't something that we were very knowledgeable on, but uh, if there's anybody out there, that would be good info. And um, I would have to say, I think we didn't do very good on our pinup board or whatever that board was called. So if you need me to go back and do that for slow foods, let me know how to do that. But I think we totally missed that one. You're good. You were just having a good discussion. So, no, that's great. Yeah. Um, great. We also thing. talked about freezing. Um, there was some conversation about temperature and storage of, of fish at colder temperatures, um, keeps better quality. So, um, I think, again, that's one thing that I can just touch on from our experiences of really having good freezers and making sure that your fish is taken care of for the, you know, because most of us are putting up seasonal fish and carrying it through the year as long as we can um, have it in inventory. So um, there's definitely some techniques to making sure that your your fish is um, frozen properly to have good quality throughout the whole year. That is key and it's pretty remarkable just how technology has advanced, at least what I've seen in Alaska and the salmon industry just, you know, a decade ago even, you know, there was a real stigma around frozen fish um, because it was just handled differently and frozen differently. And that's really changed, um, which is exciting because it's allowed fishermen to sell throughout the year, ship in maybe more sustainable, um, less cost prohibitive ways. But there's also a real barrier then when it comes to educating chefs and consumers who think fresh is best um, you know, there's, there's definitely an education need and opportunity there around frozen fish, but the quality is really just, yeah, pretty remarkable. Um, Marsh, welcome. Do you have anything you want to add from the breakout discussion? Anything that struck you or, um, that, that you'd want to share with the larger group? No, no. We just kind of talk like, uh, business to business, uh, kind of processes. So happy awesome. to answer any greater questions later on. Okay. Great. Yeah, I know you're, you'll be coming up next, so we'll get to hear a lot more from you shortly. Um, well, any other uh, immediate questions folks might have, um, you know, before we really close this discussion? Um, if you've got anything burning you want to say, just add it to the chat. Um, but again, we're, you know, this is just the beginning of a much bigger discussion. So, you know, hopefully we'll continue to dig deeper into all of these topics and themes and questions that are, that are coming up. Um, well, I think with that, I am going to, I'm going to say we're going to break here for the next five minutes. Um, so folks could, you know, just be back here in five minutes and then we're going to have Sarah lead us through the next set of stories, um, and thought leaders. And we'll have another chance to break out 
ask more questions. So, you know, if something hasn't been addressed that you're really interested in, you know, please bring that to the next um, portion of the discussion. And a big thanks to all of our storytellers and thought leaders in this first portion. Just really inspiring and exciting to hear what you all are doing. It's just, yeah, it's pretty incredible. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Seafood Supply Chain Deep Dive. Can everybody hear me okay? I'm going to take that as a yes. Um, thanks to all our storytellers so far and the thought leaders for sharing on themselves and Elizabeth for leading us through it. We've heard some great stories about pivots that people have made during COVID and all the hats that small business owners wear. And um, we've got some great stories lined up, some more inspiring stories, and I expect more nourishing conversation. Um, so first, uh, I'm going to tell you a little about me. And I'm a NOAA, I'm a fishery biologist for NOAA Fisheries in San Diego, and I wear a lot of hats. And the one that gives me the most joy is my research around sustainable seafood supply chains and the interactions with fishing communities that that entails. Things like direct marketing, the value of working waterfronts, and barriers to U.S. seafood. Um, I've worked with a team to evaluate, for example, the economic value of San Diego fisheries, information that quite a few people are interested in given that our downtown is slated for redevelopment, that's the area where the majority of our active commercial fishing fleet is located. Um, and recently embarked on a cross NOAA fisheries collaboration with the local catch network and USDA to better understand the direct marketing landscape. Really, we don't know the full extent of this demographic. And that lack of information can, um, that could affect our ability to understand the full impact of regulations or market forces as well as community access to government programs. So I hope to keep this group apprised of the effort as it progresses. So with that, uh, let's move on to our storytellers. And as you hear them tell their stories, I encourage you to consider, are there common themes, challenges, or solutions that we can identify and learn from or even replicate? And um, what are steps for addressing these challenges that folks are taking? So sit back and enjoy these stories since you probably just got some coffee or a fresh beverage during your break. And listen to these folks who are telling about how they're committed to bringing sustainable seafoods to their community. Our first storyteller for this part is Jenny DeVivo. So Jenny is the executive chef and cafeteria director for the Up Island Schools on the island of Martha's Vineyard. And since launching her school meals program in 2011, she's made it her mission to source local food for the school's daily lunches. Part of that dedication is about fostering real relationships with local farmers, fishermen, and food purveyors. Jenny has pioneered many farm and sea to school program initiatives and teaches local food driven cooking workshops throughout the country. Through her leadership, she has formed many meaningful alliances, which enable her to teach students how their food gets to their lunch trays. So Jenny, can you tell us a bit about yourself, your work, and the challenges and successes you've had in that work? Thank you, Sarah. Hi, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you virtually and celebrating all things sustainable seafood. Um, for the last 10 years, I have been a chef here on Martha's Vineyard um, and fortunate enough to be given an opportunity to launch a, a sustainable meals program for two public schools here on Martha's Vineyard. Um, my mission was to really dial back the choices and really focus on sourcing sustainably. So over the last 10 years, I've developed programs and initiatives that enable me to, as Sarah said, teach kids exactly what is on their lunch trays so that they get value in every single bite. Um, when I started the program, it was super easy to connect with my farmers and my food purveyors, but there was a missing piece to my local puzzle, and that was sustainable seafood. And as much as I looked um, across the country and researched, I couldn't find a way to get seafood into schools. Um, come to a conference and I walk right into my friend Jared from Red's Best and he has pioneered a program that was called Catch of the Day and the light bulb went off and I immediately knew that I could get kids to eat seafood. So what I've done is dedicate one day every single week and I serve kid approved simple seafood dishes to my students. Um, 
I educate them about the story of the fish because with this fish that I purchase every single week comes a traceability aspect. So I know who caught the fish, how the fish was caught, where it was caught. And so pre-COVID, I was able to tell the kids the story physically while they were eating, which enabled them to not only taste the seafood, but to hear the seafood and see the seafood and envision exactly what that role they played in eating that fish meant to the fishermen that caught that food. So from things like fish bites or buttercracker crumbed baked fish to a dumbed down paella or a lobster roll, these children now know that someone out there is sustainably sourcing their food that they get to eat. Implementing this program across the country, I found is actually really doable because there are incredible resources throughout our country where you can, as a food service individual, reach out and get local seafood into your meals program, whether it's frozen or whether it comes directly out of the water. So um, I've developed various resources, tips, recipes that can be implemented in any part of the country. Um, for me, I think the value in my job is knowing that I'm now giving children an accountability, not only to their healthy eating choices, but how they recognize the importance of their food system and the, uh, the sea and what it provides and choosing a different protein, not that meat uh, is, a, is a poor option, but fish allows them such incredible learning potential. That protein, when it enters their bodies and their brains, really connects them and allows them to focus for the rest of the day. Um, Food comes from so many different shapes and sizes. So it's not, a, a for me, it wasn't a hard choice to serve them. Um, I would reach, I would ask anybody to feel free to reach out to me in any way, shape or form. Um, I have recipes and so many little educational pieces that uh, really make the children excited to eat food. We invite fishermen to our meals. We've had a seafood celebration where we've had oyster fishermen and mussel growers and so many people that are forward thinking fishermen and foodies come and celebrate the beauty of seafood here in our island. We invited every single kid here. So it's a doable option. It's something I believe wholeheartedly in. Um, I'm a little bit way too passionate about it at times, but I can honestly tell you, it's not rocket science. It's a simple lunch made with healthy ingredients from the beautiful bounty of our sea. And um, I am happy to be here to share it and my story. Thank you so much for introducing me, Sarah. Thank you, Jenny. And your passion certainly comes through. And I would wager to say that it's infectious. Um, you know, I, I want to ask you briefly about um, any of the logistical hurdles that you may have had to deal with when bringing that seafood in. So maybe you know where you want to get the seafood. How did you actually go about that? Were there resources available to you or financial limitations? Well, I practice a lot of uh, food rescue and um, my budget is extremely tight. So I did what was called sort of reduce that mall mentality. So most schools, they'll offer a myriad of choices every day. And I sort of dialed it back to offer a hot meal, a sandwich and a salad bar, freeing up cash for me to utilize and purchase nutrient dense ingredients. And with the program that I jumped into um, with both feet with Red's Best, um, allowed me to get a sort of sustainable seafood into my schools at a relatively inexpensive price. Um, there are weather constraints. There are times when the fish that I think I'm getting, I don't get. But how I deal with my daily meals is that I'm flexible. So every menu or menu or recipe that I'm serving, they it can fluctuate. It's very flexible. So for instance, today we did fish cakes, and my fish came yesterday. I was expecting cake pollock. I got albacore. I said, all right, let's do it. So I just, I think flexibility is how I, I, I sort of jump over my hurdles. If a boat doesn't run, I make sure that I have cans of tuna in my 
um, my pantry so I can run, say, a tuna melt. Or I overbuy my fish that week and freeze it so that if something happens, I'm always able to serve some sort of seafood on um, the Friday. I'm a big believer in thinking outside the lunchbox. Um, so if one thing I could give anybody throughout their daily life is flexibility is key. Um, and just have something in your back pocket. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, flexibility, seafood itself is flexible, so that probably works. And what you're saying about getting kids excited about the food and seeing their their place in that seafood system really reflects on what I hear about school programs that also, when they're working with farmers or they're growing food on school property, same, very similar sorts of things. When kids see a pea grow, a sugar snap pea grow, they're way more likely to eat it. That's the, that's the mission and that's the model that we live by is that from vegetables to dairy to anything that we're serving, it comes with a story. Somebody took the time to bring it to them. Um, it's, it's delicious, it's nutritious, but it has a value and they need to know about it. And it makes them excited. Thanks, Jenny. Um, and I think we're gonna move on to Kaylin and we'll have time to ask uh, these folks more questions. So we're gonna move on to Kaylin, and I see she's queued up there. This is Kaylin Slider. She's a fifth generation fish harvester from the settler community of Suantula, British Columbia in unceded Kwakwakiwak territory. Kaylin grew up fishing salmon on her family's 35 foot gill netter, the mainly three and now fishes in a variety of different fisheries, including but not limited to halibut and spawn. Prawn, yeah. Kaylin, take it away. Thanks for the intro, Sarah. Um, and thanks, Jenny, for sharing all your work and to everyone who's shared today. Um, my partner and I were chatting yesterday about how in our fishing community, so many um, roles of leadership and change makers are women. And that is very much a trend that I see here in Slow Fish. So it's really exciting. Um, so yeah, thank you. And just a uh, quick clarification, my last name is Cedar, like the tree. Um, my family, it's an anglicized Finn name and it's Turkey. My first name's Turkey too. If you get past my first name, then my last name will sure to be stumbled upon. So um, hi everyone, thanks for having me. Um, Sarah, you gave an excellent introduction. I'm yeah, fifth generation fisherman from Sointula. Um, I'm also the coordinator for the BC Young Fishermen's Network, a fairly new coordinator to the BC Young Fishermen's Network. Um, I've been in this role maybe six, seven months, but prior to that, I was on the steering committee for three years since its inception. Um, so I was sharing in our breakout session, in our Pollock breakout session, that when I was asked to share during the steep dive, um, I had to take a few days to think about what I was going to say. Um, I myself, I'm not directly involved in any of the or any similar cool projects like the ones that have been shared, um, but I am a fisherman. Um, I think my first jobs, I was reflecting on this yesterday, my first jobs as a kid, and I don't know, even know if I can call them jobs, I probably got paid in candy and fries, but it was, you know, selling salmon or shrimp at a the back of my parents' truck in front of the co-op store in Sointula. And it was a hoot. Um, so I guess that is very uh, fisherman direct to consumer uh, supply chain. But anyhow, I was wondering, yeah, what am I going to talk about? What am I going to talk about? And you know, I was looking through our coordinating document and I realized, you know, the common theme is boat, 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 boat to market, boat to consumer, boat to chef. Um, like, oh, well, I know boats, I know fishermen, I'll chat about that. Um, so yeah, just to share a little bit of uh, some of our challenges and some of the stuff we're doing up here in BC, uh, both myself and the Young Fishermen's Network. So the Young Fishermen's Network um, is a community project. Uh, our parent organization is Teapuk Suzuki Foundation. Um, so it's really a space for us to gain community and share resources and, and really just connect uh, some of our members are heavily involved in direct marketing models. Uh, some are involved in policy and change, but what brings us together is that we're all fishermen. 
and BC Young Fishermen's Network is a place where we can celebrate that and uplift one another. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm new in this role as a coordinator. Um, I fell into the camp of the Young Fishermen's Network members being involved in advocacy uh, rather than marketing, but it's really important to remember that it's all interconnected. Nothing in fishing, nothing in the supply chain, nothing in community work exists in isolation. Uh, we all rely on each other. So yesterday in the Young Fishermen's World Cafe, we're of course talking about young fishermen and uh, Jordan and Ryan were sharing some of their challenges and some of their opportunities and some of their stories. And uh, Andrea shared that I think where she is in New England, they consider 40 and under to be young fishermen. But here in BC, I think our benchmark is 55 and under. <laughs> so I'm now in the millennial camp and anytime I start to feel old, I just think of myself as a fisherman and then I feel young again. Um, so yeah, about young fishermen here, uh, you know, we were talking in the Pollock room a bit about regulatory barriers to intergenerational succession, you know, whether that succession is succession of knowledge or story or capital or resources access. Um, it's, in my experience, it's tough to concentrate on recruiting new entrants with no previous exposure to the industry when, you know, we don't even have economic or political policy to encourage folks that are born into the industry to stay in the industry. Um, but I do think that by making our systems of production more equitable, our, our, our political systems as well, our economic systems, um, our supply chain will be as well. Um, and I think that goes back to what Ryan Bradley was saying during, again, the World Cafe yesterday. If an overarching goal of ours is to support and grow the community of young fishermen, you know, we need to rebuild and recreate those systems. And you know, we, you're just saying, Sarah, that we all wear different hats and, and I certainly wear a few. Um, you know, not everyone is an organizer and activist and that's great, you know, we all have different roles. But for us, for fishermen, for young fishermen, or for fishermen of all ages, really, to continuously have to fight for your livelihood is exhausting. Um, it can feel really lonely when we move outside our home fishing communities. Sometimes it feels like the public just wish we didn't exist, um, never mind being interested in our stories. So I'm really happy for the space, and I'm really happy for all this work that Slow Fish does. Um, yeah, where am I? Yeah, we all have an important role, whether it be organizing or creating spaces like this to grow community or building supply chains that link that good food with fair prices for harvesters. Every role is important. We need everyone, but we need the people to catch the fish. Um, and again, that's why this, these communities, these events, uh, these opportunities to network are so vital. So we can disperse that load and we can all walk a little later. And, and like I said, speaking as a fisherman, to have the support of movements like Slow Fish really means the world. Um, it's so important to build and sustain these communities of care. And when we do, when our fishermen are loved and celebrated and supported, then our supply chains are also rooted in that equity, justice and joy. So that's a little bit about me and the stuff that I think about often and the work that I do. Kaylin, thank you so much for sharing about your story and really speaking from the heart. Um, those are some important things you said. And one of the many things you said that struck me was talking about um, when our systems of production, also our systems of policy, et cetera, when those systems are equitable, then young fishermen will have more opportunity and ability to get into and stay in this industry so that mm -hmm. we have you to feed us. So if you were, you know, the the queen of the world and you had control <laughs> over all of these things, what what would that a more equitable system look like? What what or what one change would you implement so that these systems were more equitable for say you and your community? Well, 
I think step one would be putting the power of decision making into those communities, starting, you know, at the bottom of that period and working the way your way up rather than the top down model. And I think, again, that's what slow fish is all about. It's, it's very grassroots. And I think that's, you know, I, <laughs> I can, you know, go into my own political theory, which I'll save you all right now. Um, but I think, yeah, starting at the bottom, starting at community and giving folks an opportunity to share their stories and their dreams and their visions for the future. And, you know, doing it in spaces like this that are, that are safe, that are encouraging, that are supportive, um, that, that we feel cared in. I think starting there, we need more bottom up, less top down. We need all bottom up. <laughs> Thanks for that. Thanks for that. And I would say this group is interested in you and Fishers and your stories are very much of interest and welcome and wanted here. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And I think we're going to move on to Marsh. Now we have Marsh Skeel, who's no stranger to slow fish. Good to see you again, Marsh. Yeah. Um, Marsh is a second generation commercial fisherman and seafood lover that helps start Sitka salmon shares. I think he's going to tell us about that. And his passion for quality has guided Sitka salmon's boat to doorstep supply chain that will deliver over 40,000 CSF members this year. So Marsh, please tell us a bit about yourself, your business, and anything you want to tell us about your successes or challenges in that world. No, thanks for the intro, Sarah. And, uh, Great uh, lead-in, Scalen. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, I grew up, I'm a second generation fisherman, so I grew up fishing with my family in, in Southeast Alaska. Um, and in my mid twenties, right when I bought, had bought my first boat, uh, I have always been a lover of food and great ingredients. And I really loved, you know, hook and line salmon trolling is pretty amazing way to make a living. But there, there was also a disconnect in that you're taking this amazing ingredient and then just selling it on a commodity market didn't feel like it was valued or it didn't it didn't feel like uh, the connection was strong enough to the end user. I didn't really realize that, but it felt it felt just kind of like you're just a meat producer. And um, through some some friends I made in Sitka, um, I was able to ship some fish down for a little fundraiser to, for a nonprofit and. All those people got my fish and were super excited and 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 wanted more fish. So the next year, I sent some more fish down as a little buying club with with some friends, and I was able to go down and meet the people in the, the this time at the Midwest. And it was it was pretty special for me to be a to have them value the the, the fish that I caught and be so excited about it. And I thought, okay, this is something that's that I want to be part of and help build. So. So I, uh, I kind of bought into the, the little company then and, and been helping build it ever since. And so it's gone from a just a few fishermen, some of their catch to in 2015, we bought our own processor and took a bunch of fishermen owners on and, and uh, you know, we've done various different things, but we've kind of kept growing our model and, and figuring things out. And now we, now we ship nationwide. Um, so we do like a seasonal CSF where we, you know, catch fishermen catch the fish in Alaska we process it up here in, in Sitka and other ports and and barge and truck it to to the Midwest and from there it goes around the country so it's been a it's been an exciting ride Marsh um appreciate that information and it sounds like you've been the organization as it's transitioned from smaller to bigger and you know, we've discussed this in other venues, and I'm, I'm curious if you can weigh in on how you and your organization has maintained your values as you transition to a larger scale. Oh, great question. Uh, I think it was always inherent in what we did about, uh, so we kind of set up the company with, with uh, fishermen owners and board seats, so we had voices from the fleet. And I think our goal was really to be a, a completely transparent company in, in what we do. And that's really tied to our membership base too. So we, we try to do good as, as from like paying 
fair prices that can keep fishermen in business. It means uh, looking across our whole supply chain and making sure there's nothing we're trying to hide, like the worker, you know, the the minimum wage we pay our warehouse or fish plant workers or delivery drivers. So I think all of that ties into wanting to be this company that does better. So we've always, I think we've all, we've always been focused on that of, of how do we do it in a just like capitalism, but in a just as possible way. So we've been, uh, we've been pretty dedicated to, I guess that. And then that's really, I guess that our mem and in celebrating that our membership or CSF members, we try to be a company that they want to support. So like doing good. And then our, the only reason that we're able to do the good, do all that good is because we really retain people at a really high rate and people are, our customers are really excited about supporting a company that does that. So I think that's like trying to keep the triple bottom line going and, and, uh, and make a business work as a challenge. But uh, it also, I think has some, has some other benefits so you can do good and then, and celebrate that and, and build a really loyal following. Yeah, thanks for that. That celebration is key and that that just capitalism. Um, I hope we can hear more, more about that as we continue this conversation. Um, and I, I am going to, we're going to transition to our thought leaders now. And, um, and, and after that, we're going to um, open. I can't have you in here when I'm doing this, honey. So either go on the porch we're going to open up uh, to more questions from the audience. So we have Andrea Tomlinson coming up next as one of our thought leaders. Great to see you again, Andrea. Andrea has a, a varied career in the mean world from scientist to farmer to CSF manager. She's a strong advocate for local food and fish consumption and knowing your food producers. She's been the general manager of New Hampshire Community Seafood, a community supported fishery and restaurant supported fishery for seven years. She's also passionate about the development of the next generation of fishermen in New England. Andrea, please take it away. Everybody, thank you. I'm going to attempt to upload my PowerPoint and I know Jen S is right there for me if I need her. Okay. Oh my God, it happened. Can everybody see that? I do not. You, you do not see that? It says New Hampshire Community Seafood, no? Can you see it now? Not here. No. Not here. Okay. Hey, Jen H, are you there to help me? I sure am. All right. I'm on, I followed the directions. I'm sorry I missed the tutorial. I'm on your entire screen up at the top left. I'm on Chrome. Okay. In the middle, click application window. Yep. And then click on your PowerPoint. You have it open, right? I do. Okay. And then when you click on it, it should... There you go. Got yep. it? We can see it now. And then when you click. Great, is everyone, is everyone seeing? Okay. Perfect. There we go. All right, so everyone's seeing the first screen and can hear my voice? Excellent. Yay, thank you. Um, Amanda Davis said we could do a PowerPoint, so I decided to give you guys a little break from people's faces and give you some nice visuals. So uh, my name is Andrea Tomlinson. I'm the general manager of New Hampshire Community Seafood. I started with NH Community Seafood in 2015. Um, it, we are a community and a restaurant supported fishery started by Josh Wiersma, who was the then sector manager for our commercial fisherman here in New Hampshire, and Sarah Van Horn, who was a Sea Grant fellow and a UNH graduate student. So the reason that we developed New Hampshire Community Seafood is twofold. 
Um, right around 2010, the catch share system came into play here in New England, whereas we used to be fishing according to days at sea. Our cod fishermen would go out for the day. They were able to fish 800 pounds of cod, come back in, go home to their wives, have dinner, come back out and do it again the next day. When the National Marine Fisheries Service realized we had a huge dramatic reduction in the 2008 age class specifically of the Atlantic cod in the Gulf of Maine, they cut our sector's allotment of cod by 97%. So in numbers, how that played out was our sector, which at the time was a group of 11 commercial fishing boats that fish for ground fish, were originally allowed to catch 2 million pounds of cod for the year. After the cuts, we were allowed to catch 60,000 pounds of cod for the year. And simply in one week with all, with it. So as you can imagine, fishermen started to panic. They started to sell their permits. They started to sell their boats. They started to give into lobstering and New Hampshire community seafood came into play and said, listen, we can sell fish besides cod. We can sell underutilized species. We have a variety of ground fish species here in the Gulf of Maine. So let's try and do that. And that we have done. So we certainly have New England favorites like Atlantic cod. We can only catch a small amount of it. And we have scrod haddock, but we sell a lot of Atlantic pollock on the left-hand side of your screen. And we sell a lot of monk tail. Um, this is a monk fish, ugly on the outside, but delicious on the inside. There's a monk fish here on the right-hand side. Yet another one of our underutilized species here in the Gulf of Maine. We sell dogfish shark, otherwise known as Cape shark, a very popular fish and chip um, species over in England. We sell Acadian redfish. Meet up with some old time fishermen. They'll say, what the hell are you doing eating that? That's lobster bait. Well, Acadian redfish we have found is a wonderful food fish. It's got a nice light flavor and it happens to be in the grouper species. So how I market that is that that is our New England grouper species. We definitely have an issue with the grain of the fleet. So when I started out with New Hampshire Community Seafood, um, we had to take out a loan to pay me. They were not sure if we were going to get through the first season because the cod cuts were so severe. The fishermen were so upset. They weren't sure what they were going to do. But these three old timers you see here and our one young timer who is Lucas Raymond. Some of you may remember him from Slow Fish um, in former years. Unfortunately, these three guys have retired and we have not seen um, a lot of succession. For instance, Lucas is still a deckhand. Once in a while, he'll captain for the boat that he's on, but we haven't seen any young fishermen replace these three gentlemen who've retired. I'm now working with about four boats as opposed to 11 boats. Um, two of our boats have gone off to do their own direct marketing, but because of these retirements and, and no young fishermen to replace them, we're really down to about four to five boats for ground fish. What we really try and do at New Hampshire Community Seafood is uh, get people to eat with the ecosystem and stress that our food, our, our fish and our, we do shellfish as well, is always fresh, never frozen. By the time the fish is landed, it gets to the consumer within um, 48 to 72 hours. And I can successfully say that I can 100% trace every single piece of seafood that we sell back to its origin. And I'm really proud of that. We try to follow most of the local catch.org uh, uh, core values that we developed at our seafood summit in Norfolk. So this is just an example of the different types of uh, weekly fish memberships and shellfish memberships that we have. So we base ourselves on a on a typical CSA model, a community supported agriculture model. For those of you who are, aren't aware of that, that's what farmers would, would use to sell their product. Um, and we also uh, just recently on the bottom left-hand corner here, you can see we just developed last year a flexible fish membership, which has been incredibly popular, especially with COVID where you can basically order a la carte, whatever you want, whenever you want, you don't have to commit to a weekly fish share or a bi-weekly shellfish share. It was very popular last year. We also operate a restaurant supported fishery for restaurants and retailers. We have a number of boutique local foods, quite a few farm to table restaurants in the Portsmouth Seacoast area and beyond. 
So we have a thriving restaurant supported fishery um, model that we really looked at what Doc to Dish was doing, Sean Barrett down there in New York, and kind of um, used his model as an example for how we wanted to do things. We sell whole fish and fillets, and mostly fillets, as Kayla was was saying earlier, are what we see a lot of the fisher, the uh, restaurants here in New England are looking for filleted fish, but we have tried very much to get them to utilize the whole fish. The way we're structured is really unique. Um, we, uh, the, the, the way that we were structured, we got a help from a gentleman named George Benson up in um, Minnesota, worked with a lot of community supported agriculture models. We're actually a multi-stakeholder for-profit cooperative. So what that means is we have shareholders who are fishermen. This is one of our fishermen shareholders and board members on the right, Dennis Rubillard. And we also have um, shareholders who are consumers. So it's it's co-owned by our fishermen. 80% of the ownership is in the fishermen shareholders' hands and 20% is in our consumer shareholders' hands. So it's a really unique model. This is um, every year as patronage for being a member of our co-op, we throw a huge annual shareholders party for our shareholders and our fishermen. So everybody gets to get together with the fishermen and we uh, ply them with local seafood and local beer and wine. And these people, just to be clear, are consumer shareholders who have bought a class C stock within our company. We also partner with a variety of different um, local farms. So, you know, like-minded people like to buy local fish. So we partner with a lot of farm stores who are literally distributing their CSA um, shares at the very same time that we are distributing our CSF shares at their farm store. And we found that that is a really great way to get the word out. And um, lately here in New Hampshire, a lot of farm stores are wanting to diversify and bring in all different types of products from other farmers, including us as fishers. We do a lot of outreach and education work as well. I'm a real advocate on getting the word out about these different species and eating with the ecosystem and underutilized species. So we've been um, to a number of, you know, Ocean Days, Piscataqua, River Fest, anything that UNH puts on, Sea Grant helps us get out into our restaurants and spread the word about underutilized species. And at our farmer's market, we always offer outreach and education um, supplies as well. We're at about four farmer's markets in the seacoast. My biggest passion, however, is to develop a New Hampshire Young Fisherman Alliance. So these are two of our really great uh, poster, poster young fishermen. Three long years ago, we did a great story on New Hampshire um, NPR, National Public Radio, New Hampshire, about these two guys, um, Zach Griggs on the left and Lucas Raymond, who's participated again in Slow Fish um, in the past on the right. And just, you know, equity issues that we're talking about, the biggest obstacle with young fishermen is the capital needed to not only maintain your mortgage for your boat, your equipment, your deck hands, your insurances and your dock fees, but also your permit in the catch share system. You've got to have a qualifying permit to even be able to get into the quota share game. And that's what we're trying to do for these guys. So two years ago with Sea Grant um, and with the help of the New Hampshire Food Alliance through the University of New Hampshire, we did some doc talks with all the young fishermen up and down the seacoast, found out what they felt they needed for success. And we are trying to move forward with their suggestions and hopefully we'll do so with the upcoming money from the Young Fishermen's Development Alliance funding through National Sea Grant. I really look forward to working with young fishermen and keeping our thriving New Hampshire fishing industry going. Wow, Andrea, that's thank you for that. That's wonderful. Your um, your focus on partnering and using underutilized fish and and eating with the ecosystem sounds not only it's not only very impressive. It's it sounds delicious. Um, it's also inspiring. Um, I, I've heard you talk about your passion about helping young fishermen get into or stay in the the field. And you mentioned some work that you're doing with Sea Grant, which sounds really exciting. Um, it, in addition to capital, wh what do you think New England needs to grow its next generation? What what would help what would help these young fishermen get into and stay in 
the field of fishing. Well, I've talked to a lot of partners down in Massachusetts. You know, young fishermen really need help with taxes. A lot of fishermen have an issue with filing taxes. Um, they've seen their predecessors have issues with filing taxes, so that seems to come right down the pike as well. Fishermen desperately need business management training, how to develop a budget, how to stick by your budget, right? How to acquiesce a loan, how to get through with a loan if you don't have a lot of collateral, how to use your boat as collateral for a loan, how to, ref how to find um, organizations here in New Hampshire. We have a revolving loan fund through our Port Authority. We also have a group called New Hampshire Community Loan Fund who's, who's willing to take high risk um, applicants for loans. So these kind of business resources are what we're finding across the board throughout Northern New England, what fishermen are really saying that they need for success. Thanks for that. Appreciate that. Um, and I think in the interest of time, I'm, I, we need to move on to Jared if he's available. Jared, are you with us? Yeah, perfect. So Jared's the CEO and owner of Red's Best, an innovative technology and logistics platform that builds efficiency and traceability in order to support small fishing fleets and ensure maximum freshness. He began his career of commercial fishing in Alaska and New England. Red's Best directly unloads seafood from a network of over a thousand commercial fishermen. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to Jared to tell us a bit more about himself, his business, and um, what's helped him succeed and overcome some of the many challenges in this field. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Thanks, everybody, for having me um, be part of this. Hope I can share my story and if people have questions, let me know. So, um, yeah, the intro talks about the technology. The technology was really a solution to a challenge we had. Uh, it didn't start, you know, sort of came from living some pain. Um, I started out, uh, I don't have any like fam jealous of Marsh and Kaylin and Brett and everybody else on here. I didn't have any family or any connection to the seafood industry or to fishing, but always loved fishing. Uh, found my way onto a saner out of Petersburg after I graduated college and just really fell in love with uh, the industry kind of from seeing it from the water looking in. Um, Fortunately, Andrea and everybody else, there wasn't a Young Fishermen's Association or organization back then. Um, I didn't really feel like it was an option at that point to make a living commercial fishing. So kind of was compelled by the industry and started getting my feet wet, learning the industry. Um, I started Red's Best um, with a focus on trying to, you know, I just thought, hey, maybe, you know, maybe I can use my sort of my natural skill set, uh, which was not running boats, but maybe I can use, you know, what is a natural skill set to me to have a positive impact on these men and women that I really grew a immense respect for while I was working for them. Um, so kind of dove in, oh, I took a lot of jobs in the industry, but started unloading boats, started in Woods Hole Mass and sort of grew from there. And, you know, our challenge, what I was trying to do, this is like 2008 was really when we started doing this. Um, it was like, I, I want to find, this is really when all, um, all the regulations were really starting to gain intensity uh, from a health code standpoint and a regu regulatory standpoint. And then everything else you have to do, as all the business owners here know, it only starts there, right? Then it's DOT and, you know, all the harbor masters and every municipality and just on and on and on. Um, and Sort of, so our challenge was like, how do we, is there a way to like, I'm also, so I, I was also sort of coming into an industry in New England that's like really well established, right? Like the big players are really well known. They've been around for a long time. They're pretty good at what they do and they have really deep pockets. So like all things that I didn't have. So I was like, how do, you know, and, and I've always been a scale guy, like for better or worse. And I've certainly take my lumps because of, uh, just my desire to always grow and be bigger, more and more and more impactful. I've, I've, I've taken my lumps, but it just, I've sort of, I've just accepted that that's who I am. So, so my challenge is how, how do I grow scale given that sort of environment that I explained? So this is like the early days. And what I saw was there were all these like small independent fishermen that were kind of getting left behind, especially as the regulations kicked in, because with the regulations, you, 
you got this like fixed cost per transaction, right? So to unload a boat, whether that boat sells the one striped bass or a hundred thousand pounds of codfish, I still basically have to do the same, you know, I have the same fixed overhead associated with that one transaction. So um, our challenge in the early days was like, is there a way to use technology to get really, really efficient at handling all these little data points so we can unload a, a lot of little boats um, and sort of build scale to where we can build infrastructure and you know, like impactful infrastructure. Um, and we did that. So we spent probably took two or three years. We built some cool web-based technology that makes us really efficient at handling that data. So and to, to, to give it perspective, in 2000, on July 25th, 2019, we unloaded 378 different boats, unique transactions in that one day. And like some of those transactions were like 6,000 pounds with like 12 different, you know, species and all these specs. And some of those transactions were like 10 pounds of razor clams or like, or like one to talk. Um, but our software enabled us to just do that all really efficient. So we got really good at like aggregating um, fish. And there were a lot of challenges with that, right? Because with that comes you have to hire drivers and get trucks. And I had ratty beat up trucks and all that. And a lot of people in this sort of watched me sort of stumble through those years. But anyway, we sort of like, um, what's interesting too, just I actually intended to be shorter with my talk than I'm going on already, but I'll just keep going because I know who's on here. But uh, what's interesting, if people recall, like the we used to talk about transparency. When I got in the industry, we thought about trans, and that's not that long ago. It's like 2008, right? The, like, um, I remember with Josh, Andrew, you mentioned Josh, he was like a big part of us. Like transparency meant, at least to me, transparency back then meant like dealer to fisherman transparency, right? So that that had a lot of impact on our early sort of technology building because I wanted to be, right? Like I don't want to, I didn't want to be the fish dealer like that, you know, had animosity with the fishermen. That was the last thing I wanted to do with my life, right? So in the early days, and a big part of our technology and our software was like, how do I be like really clear about this transaction to the fishermen that I'm working with so I can foster this relationship that I, I knew down the line would have uh, you know, like allow me to be really impactful and just something that I cared about personally. Uh, so that was a big part of the, of the software. Anyway, so, uh, you know, the technology allowed us to build scale and it led to a big diversity. So that's sort of like, you know, my job is to match supply and demand, right? Um, so that's the supply side. Then the demand side was sort of like just a fun challenge back in the day. Like, you know, like I didn't know how to sell fluke until like I got a thousand pounds of fluke and had to sell it. And it started just, you know, I'd call somebody and I'd be like, uh, 375. And if I, they, if I felt like they were really eager to buy the next guy, I'd call be like $4, you know, and if they didn't buy any, the next guy would be 350. I sort of like worked it out, but it became this really fun puzzle to solve. Um, of like, how do you match the supply and demand? And like, you know, I don't know all the different fisheries out there, but we have this like incredible diversity of items in our in our waters here in New England. I mean, from like thousand pound bluefin tuna to a periwinkle and everything in between. Um, and we just, that was the fun part, right? So we set on this journey to like, you know, find, you know, match supply and demand. So a monk liver goes to Japan on a Tuesday. And, and it, it's really cool because you find that like, a jumbo, like a four pound fluke and a two pound fluke are totally different, you know, in terms of the geographic, ethnographic and demographic de uh, demand distribution, right? So we did that and, and what we realized is the, the, our biggest challenge, which like almost like everybody I've heard talk to speak today has really found, you know, cool, unique ways to tackle this problem. But it's, it's like this misalignment of supply and demand, right? you know, large brick and mortar retailers in our area, and I think everywhere, look for large scale commodity items with a predictable price point, predictable supply. And that's just not what we were unloading from all these small community-based fishermen that like really wanted to make happy. And, you know, so mis misaligned supply and demand is the customer, you know, thinks they want haddock, but the fishermen land at Hake. And I'm sitting in the middle. I care a lot about both these people. And I'm I'm pulling my hair out because when supply and demand is misaligned, the customer is in a high demand, low supply scenario, price goes up. Uh, uh, fisherman is in a high supply, low demand scenario, and price goes down. 
So everybody, nobody's happy, and, and often it's a near miss. It's like cake and haddock. So uh, we've done a lot. I overlap with a lot of people sort of in this, um, in you know, uh, associated with this. But really, to us, it, it, to me, it's all about finding different ways. And there's a million different ways, but finding different ways to, to access flexible demand, right? Through like what Marsh and them do. And just, I could list everybody uh, uh, I know on here. And a lot of you are a part of it, right? So, you know, in terms of like Jenny and getting to institutions, that's like one segment of it. But right, we created, a, I think, a, an intelligent way to, to access flexible demand for a certain chunk or a certain like piece of that portfolio, right? And then, you know, but Jenny's not buying $15 a pound fish. And there's fishermen, you know, there's certain species where fishermen expect to get paid $15 a pound. I mean, it's been just like a long story of trials and tribulations specific to the infrastructure, which I know everybody here has, has spoken about that. There's just no easy way to do it. It's expensive and building teams of people is hard and takes time, you know, like you could read every business book in the world or go to Harvard business school. Like to me, it's all about the people and, you know, forming good like relationships and strong teams, you know, it takes, deaths and births and summers and winters and, um, you know, good times and bad times, COVID, not COVID. Um, so, um, yeah. And, and then just to like stay on the theme of what a lot of other people are talking about, we've certainly found that if you want to influence a consumer to be flexible or anybody, whether it's an institutional buyer or a consumer to be flexible, if you can start telling the stories about the communities and the fishermen that, produce and harvest this fish, then like, who's not going to be flexible, right? Who goes, you go out to eat with a commercial fisherman, you, you open the menu and you ask the fisherman what to eat. So if we can sort of um, channel that energy at scale, that's really what we're trying to do here. So uh, I know I spoke for longer than I intended to, but thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jared. That was really interesting. You touched on a lot of themes that other people have have spoken about and maybe that's the benefit of going last in the day. Um, My yeah, I'm, I'm real. This is a really interesting model or modality that you're using. And I'm really interested in that aggregating um, the supply. So is it that this tool um, and your company helps aggregate supply from folks that are maybe smaller scale um, so that they, you can provide the quantities that are in demand? That's right. Yeah. And it's not only quantities, but it's consistency, right? So, you know, if you deal with one bluefish fisherman, you know, they're real people. Like they go on vacation, their boat breaks down, they get sick, they get bored or, you know, they, whatever, you know? So I think the, the technology allows us to deal with lots of transactions efficiently, right? Without losing our mind and paperwork. And the, the volume of small transaction creates this kind of um, yeah, like aggregate or sort of a co-op feel, though it's not a co-op. Can, can um, you speak to that, how that aggregation works? Um, yeah. Right now, what I so, have in mind is a, is a black box, but I'm sure there's yeah, more. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we have a facility in Chatham, which is like the elbow of Cape Cod, one in New Bedford, and then one in Boston where I'm at now. Uh, we had one in the vineyard for transitioning over to a co-op. Okay. Um, and we also have like 10 or 12 refrigerated trucks and we have this network of fishermen. It's actually over, I think it's like 2,700 different permits that we've dealt with, done business with, which is crazy. Um, and, you know, fishermen go out and go fishing and we send trucks or they come to our facilities all over the region. We meet them when they come in, they give us their entire catch. Mm -hmm. Um, and we, we aggregate it all in Boston or New Bedford and then ship it all over the world from there. And, you know, it's everything from like a full truckload of fresh whole dogfish on ice to like one pound, you know, backpack retail packs on dry ice, you know, to, to a con consumer. So kind of dabbling a lot. Again, that's my own fault. Um, in hindsight, it would have been easier to keep it a little bit simpler, but I'm a glutton for punishment. <laughs> Sounds like you're, you keep pushing. That makes sense. I don't, yeah. I think um, so. Sounds like you keep pushing the envelope. And, it, and so, I, like, so, yeah. So right now there's like, like we have a truck in Ipswich because it's high tide. So the diggers are all coming off the flat and like they need something to do with 
their product. So they'll put it all on our truck. And like the monkfish boats are coming in from southern New England. There's like four or five gill netters who are going to come in and our trucks are going to meet them at a harbor on Cape Cod and use our boom to unload their monks and skates and like on and on and on, right? In the summer, it's bluefin. And yeah, we just kind of take in everything and it's our job to find a home from it. I think maybe what might not be obvious, Sarah, is that um, more often than not, the price isn't established when we take the fish. So while like you think of us as like salespeople, we're really like, we're, we're more of a service provider to fishermen. Right. So the service is physically unloading the boat, and taking possession of the fish. It's like making a market for their fish. So I have salespeople downstairs, but really they're market makers or they're they're really matchmakers. They're literally matching that supply with demand, demand being our network of relationships of people who want this fish from the fishermen we represent. Um, and we're kind of sitting in the middle trying to be a platform that facilitates all of that. Um, with a lot of infrastructure, like, you know, as a lot of people on here know, you start to add up the amount of motors and, stuff, you know, with all the pallet jacks and ice machines and, you know, then you have a truck, but the truck has a motor and then the reefer unit and on and on and on. So it just takes a lot of infrastructure and expertise. And without the software, there's just no, to me anyway, there's just no way to handle that volume of transactions. I mean, Imagine 378 transactions. That's one day. You know, if it takes you 10 minutes to handle that transaction with settling to the boat, reporting to the government, you know, doing all the health code requirements, you just, you lose your mind. It's going to be impossible. Does that make sense? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think we have um, a couple of questions in the chat and um, I probably have some more elsewhere and they can be questions for any of our speakers now so um, if our speakers are there please feel free to turn your cameras back on so we can see your beautiful faces um, so I, I think there's a question uh, and I suspect it was directed towards Jared since he was the last one to speak how do you manage quality control when dealing with the many different vessels and with teaching the fisher folk I think about managing quality? Yeah, it's a really good question. Something I've thought a lot about for a long time. I think, you know, number one, we hope to create a sort of co-op feel, right? Where if three striped bass fishermen are all putting their fish on our truck, that they sort of all, you know, in a perfect world, like when I, when I go to sleep at night, I hope that like they sort of, there's peer pressure, right? Where it's like, hey, like all of our hard work is being represented by this brand you know, maybe peer pressure does it. But the reality is, is that, you know, every fisherman in the fleet tells me that they have the best fish and that everybody else sucks. And that's just a fact. And, but, but the best fishermen in the world, there's, there's this, like, it's mother nature, right? If, if Sarah, if you and I go catch a striper out in the harbor, reel it in at the same time, you know, like one's fat, one's skinny, one has a shark bite out of it. One's like missing an eye or has a gill net scar, you know, again, it's back to matching supply and demand. Like it's our job to know what to do with the like nicest, most perfect specimen striped bass that's ever come out of the ocean. And it's our job to know what to do with the striped bass with the shark bite on it and like a uh, lamprey mark or whatever on it, because it's still food and it's still somebody's hard work. And it's still coming off the quota. So yeah, that, that's a good yeah. I see Angie nodding her head there too. I, I don't know if she or Marsh or any any of you have more to add on that. It gets the shark bite fish. I'm the one that gets the <laughs> Jared's like, they don't look pretty, but they taste delicious, and I'm a sucker. That's how I'm a sucker for punishment too. I'll take it. There's a place for everything. It, it's half a joke, right? But it's like, you know, if we're feeding like large scale cafeteria food. You, you know, it's true and it works and it's oh, bad. It's amazing. It's incredible. Thanks. Jen. So we, I also saw we had a question about, uh, I think something that Kaylin said about the bottom up approach. There was appreciation for that. So I'm wondering if you, I think the question was, um, how, how do we achieve that? And I would pose that to Kaylin and, and of course, anybody else that wants to respond to that. Well, I think what we're doing here and I, maybe I've just been 
no, I don't think we can pat Slowfish on the back too much. I think what we're doing here is really amazing. And I think this is a start, right? We're building community. We're having these conversations. We're sharing ideas and we're sharing what we're up to. And yeah, I think just building community and supporting that community is where we start. If anybody else wants to jump in, I'm, I'm going to ask, oh, go ahead, Jared. Well, I had a thought there too. I was also like, I liked what Kalen said that like jumped out of it too, but we actually have really good relationships with the regulators in our area. And I, I think that's not the common narrative to the public, but I think that would be a really positive message to share with them. And I don't know if there's things like this for the regulators, right? Like does Story Read at the Mass Division Marine Fisheries have a relationship with like Kalen's equivalent to Story Read? And I think if they did and they could share best practices and create a more positive um, sort of like, I don't know. I think they could learn from each other. Maybe there's something there. I don't know, but that was a good point, Kalen. Go ahead, Andrea. To speak to that too, Jared. So I too always feel like I'm a liaison between the commercial fishing community and the regulators at National Marine Fisheries or um, what we call GARFO, the Great Atlantic Regional Fisheries. All NOAA, all folks who are regulating and, um, you know, generally fishermen hate National Marine Fisheries Service as a, as a rule. And I noticed that runs right down into the young fishermen as well. But what I'm always trying to do is to at least get them to advocate for themselves. So, you know, to NIMS, National Marine Fisheries credit, there's oftentimes public hearings regarding a lot of their um, restrictions and regulation changes that they are asking for public opinion, constantly trying to get fishermen to those. They put out a big um, question ask last year up and down the East Coast. What do you think about the catch share system? Most people think it's really horrible. I said, let's get out there and tell them. So it's really important. I, I feel I have a really great relationship with, with regulators and, and with fishermen. And I think it's it's a really important um, position to be able to be that liaison between regulators and the fishing industry because there's there's a lot of animosity there and you've got to have a bridge. There really has to be a bridge. I appreciate that, Andrea, quite a bit working for no fisheries and we I work on the science arm and absolutely those connections to fishermen and, and their input, it, it nourishes our science and our regulators, they need that information as well. And the ones that I work with, they they welcome it. Um I I think I think um we probably are out of time for questions and I have so many more, I'm sure the audience does too. And I really, really appreciate the stories that we heard in this part of this session and and earlier. They've really been um, really wonderful. Um, and I think uh, I'm not sure, but Collis, did you want to say something, or did you want me to jump into some of the uh, dominant issues or dominant themes that I've heard today? Um, given we're over time, I want to punt it back to some of our our slow fish virtual leaders to see how they want to handle it. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. I mean, I think, you know, first of all, everyone has done a, a wonderful job. You know, these stories are, are really compelling. Um, it, everything, even as Sally says, they're inspiring. And there's a lot of connective tissue here between all of these themes. Um, you know, we're talking about uh, infrastructure, for example. It, the need to have viable infrastructure. And that, that could be mean so many different things. That can mean uh, working waterfronts. It's such a huge issue. And where development's coming in and it's taking up space where docks are, you know, where, where fishermen need to land, that also means processing facilities. And we heard this from Kayla earlier on. But it also means, you know, ice machines. It also means, you know, um, logistics that Jerry was talking about, it's just the technology to sort out, you know, how you're going to distribute if you've got, if you are scaling. Um, it, it means um, also, you know, having what Andrea was talking about, having a business background or having some sort of business resource so you know how to run a business. 
you can be a fisherman and know how to fish, but if you don't know how to market, if you don't know how to make the connection to the consumers or whoever your customers are, you're gonna be in trouble. These are really fundamental uh, things that we all need to be thinking about. And so part of the, the, the essence of the forum that we're creating here is, first of all, sharing these kinds of stories so that you know, hopefully it might strike a chord with someone who is looking for that kind of information, like packaging. And this is also, again, going back to the idea of infrastructure. How do we get smarter about packaging so that we're not killing, you know, the ecosystem that the, the seafood that we're depending on has to have clean? Um, so thinking ahead about packaging, well, we're not going to do this by one person. It has to be a collective think a group thing. So that's kind of getting back to that sort of, you know, what I was talking about yesterday at Slow Fish, the strength of the network is sort of the, the, the connections that we make. Um, so, you know, that's just, that's one of the big themes here is, a, is about, um, is about that kind of infrastructure. Yes, Kaylin, you, you had a hand up. Oh, sorry. I was just waving goodbye. I have to run off on some official young fisherman business, but this has okay. been really wonderful. Um, All right. Thank you, Kaylin. Sorry. Sorry to cut you off, Carlos, but uh... no, no, no question. Uh, no worries. Um, uh, and so Elizabeth had a great question. Um, key partners, you know, again, relationships. This is another thing that came up. Relationships matter. They're everything. You know, we talk about what the definition of local, and it's changing. It's less about geography, and it's more about relationships. But it's the relationships within the supply chain that are making it click and then have evolved quite a bit in the past couple of years. So, you know, to Elizabeth's question, you know, what, you know, who are key partners that you all are working with, you know, in and out of the slow fish community? Um, and to, to extend that question a little more, how can that model be replicated? You know, like what Lance and Kayla are doing, what um, Steve Curian is doing, um, you know, having different partnerships, bringing different seafood products from across the country, but people know who the, the producers are. How can we replicate that? I'm going to throw that out to everybody. How can we take that model and make it something that can stick and, and be applied elsewhere? Anybody want to take that? Jared, I'm going to point to you since you, <laughs> you had so much to say before. You're, uh, you're muted. All right. Um, I don't, to me, it's just, it, a lot of it is about like just spreading a positive message, you know, like, I, I'm on the fish pier in Boston. This is like the hotbed of education, right? And there's definitely people within a 10 mile radius of me who still think there's foreign trawlers in the EEZ, who still think that, you know, who don't even realize that bluefin tuna are regulated, never mind that, you know, we're taking the time to put a unique tag on every fish we're reporting in 24 hours. Um, they don't realize that I'm looking out in the Boston Harbor that used to be horribly polluted and I can't find a piece of trash anywhere. I cannot, I can see miles from here. Humble brag. I can't see a piece of trash though. Seriously, that's a brag for my city, that part. It's like people are living in Boston. They don't realize those simple facts. And I think if we can just, to me, it's about like being positive. Um, even the stuff I said about like people don't realize that how great a relationship somebody like me has with the regulators and how much respect we have for each other and that we, you know, care about each other. Um, uh, yeah. So it's just all about positivity for me. That that's great. Uh, I agree on the, on the messaging and, and, and what you choose to message because you're the consumer is in general, doesn't understand all the stuff that, that we do. So you're going to overload them with information. If you start to get, really specific and why this is this and why we do this and why we do this. So if you, if you can focus on, on the positive things you do and back to that kind of like traceability part of it, I think you have to build a marketplace that supports that in order for it to work because it's just going to, 
it's going to cost you more. It's going to be more complicated to, you know, as, as we scale and have, you know, tenders that buy fish on the grounds, it's much more efficient for a small a tender to, to put all the, compile all the fish in, in a central hold and you lose that traceability. So if we're going to put those all in totes, that comes with like a cost and it's, 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 it's something that, that, that we're committed to doing, but also because our customers are supporting that. So I think you have to like make sure, you know, you can't, you can't do everything all at once, but you have to make sure that your like customer base can support that and you're messaging that and why it's important. Yeah. You're telling the story of your product, Without a which, doubt. which going back to, going back to Lance, you know, quick thing, Lance. So when you're, when you are looking at partnerships and, and, you know, sending stuff up to Sitka salmon shares or sending it up to New England fish monitors, what, what, what went into that decision? Like what made a good partner for doing that kind of product change? You're on mute, by the way, Lance. I mean, it's just, you know, I like their business models and, uh, you know, how the fisherman is the one who uh, the attention is focused on because, you know, when you're dealing with a commodity, a lot of times the fishing, fisherman gets lost in the mix. And, uh, you know, I like to deal with people who feel the same way about fishermen as I do. I mean, you know, without the fisherman, we wouldn't have the fish. And, you know, I mean, if, if you're willing to do the extra it takes, you know, I think you should be uh, compensated for, for doing a better job and bringing a better product to market. You know, and that, that's our thing is that, you know, we always want to make sure the fisherman gets recognized and, and that was a big drive for me to do the things that I did, you know, early on is that I felt like we were just a number out there and they never put a face on, on the fishermen. And, you know, that's, that's, people want to know the fishermen. They want to know their stories and, you know, um, you want to do the best you can for the consumer. Absolutely. So again, that goes, how do we replicate this? How can we make this so that it's something that, other fishermen in other parts of the country can resonate, you know, adapt to and, and, you know, sort of bring into their own kind of operation. You know, uh, for years now, Sea Grant has been working with fishermen and uh, we're trying to, you know, professionalize the fisheries. And um, if you go on Louisiana's uh, Wild and Fisheries website, uh, there's a lot of videos that, uh, Sea Grant is putting together, uh, and and they highlighted all these different fisheries that are are un you know they went up the whole Mississippi River and and you know brought attention to the carp fishing the uh, you know the invasive species fishing these these carp that are in the Mississippi River I mean they they did all these different things and uh, they they tell their stories online so you know I think it's a great resource for you to look at and and you know I mean I'm sure the Sea Grants and other places would be willing to do the same things and you know they've been working years to help network the fishermen with direct marketing uh, teaching them professionalization sending them to you know get HACCP certifications and and just a lot of different things that the fishermen need to know and have to do to get themselves started and, and doing things to help themselves. That's right, Lance, and, and thanks a lot for putting it that way. I just want to take a minute here for Elizabeth. I know she has to hop off. She's got another uh, a call after this. The work that she does with Salmon State, which a lot of it has to do with um, uh, supporting the, the, the fishermen in Alaska that, that are you know doing this wild harvest, this responsible wild harvest of salmon. So. Elizabeth, do you have any final thoughts on today? And first, we all, we want to thank you so much for you know co-facilitating this. Um, did a wonderful yeah, job. Yeah, no, thanks. And sorry, I have to run here. Um, no, I I think I mean just thanks to all of you for sharing your stories, and thanks to those of you who made time to. Oh, it's, I'm not able to see Elizabeth. It says her stream was not able to connect due to a network error. She's okay over oh, here. Okay, I think. Okay. okay. But thanks for the heads up. No, and thanks to everyone's patience with technology. It's a new platform for all of us. So we're, we're rolling with it. Um, yeah, I think what I am really struck with as I leave this conversation is just, it's so exciting to see how connected you all are to each other in a way that I think is really new and different. You know, for many years, you guys have had your heads down, 
Marsh, Lance, Jared, right? Like really focusing on building like a better way to do things and to move seafood. Um, and you've like figured out a lot of a lot of those better ways. And now the fact you're working together to scale up and aggregate just makes me really excited about what's possible. And I think there's just infinite additional connections that can be made throughout this network. And hopefully today's conversation inspires folks to get connected with each other and start thinking about how, you know, through those connections, you can start to um, work together, access new markets and, you know, help us really transform the seafood supply chain in the way I think we all all want to. So just thank you all for sharing and uh, look forward to being in touch after this. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Eve. Really appreciate it. I hear it. Um, Thanks, Elizabeth. And so, you know, and she touches on, on something like just staying connected after this. Well, that's the point. I mean, when we were looking at um, hosting these conversations, we weren't necessarily looking at each deep dive session as a means to an end, an answer, one answer at all. No, these are ongoing conversations. The supply chain, as we all know, is really, really complex. Jared did a great job in, you know, sort of digging into the, some of the complexities everybody else did. Um, but they're, they're changing. And, you know, as, as we've kind of touched on before, this past year has been seen a lot of change in the supply chain. And it's, it's sort of one very thin silver lining here with all of this is that it's gotten, it, more people have become more attuned to local seafood, to, to buying direct, you know, direct supply chains, knowing where their seafood's coming from. So this is, maybe this is a moment that we can capitalize on by promoting these stories. You know, like you know, Marsha's saying, that you tell the story of the seafood and, and make it so that people can understand what it is. When I go into a classroom, it's all about getting kids to understand where their seafood comes from. Yeah, it's from the ocean, but look at the process that gets there. That makes a difference. Um, so that's something to, to keep going forward. Just looking back on just a couple more themes here before we, um, I mean, we could keep going, but um, but a, a couple more th themes that, uh, that sort of came up here um, during the conversation, we talked about graying of the fleet, you know, it is being an international issue. Well, you know, that also kind of goes to sort of the storytelling, kind of the infrastructure part of it. You know, we, as, as Andrea was saying, we need to have processes in place um, to encourage young folks to get into fishing so that there's an, they've got to have an incentive there. Um, so that it makes it that they want to get involved and they want to stay in. And so that means making like business loans available, like Andrea is talking about, making um, the, you know, the technology available that they can use that will make life easier for them. Um, and then building the relationships like Jared was talking about. You build relationships with the regulators. That's probably a good thing if you can. Not every fisherman can say that. Um, but if you can, that probably helps, you know, your success going forward. So th these are other things, you know, sort of on, on the, the, um, if we, if we had our a big colossal jam board here, th these are some of the themes that keep coming up in the conversation. Um, and it was because we did keep track of a few things. Um, adaptability. Absolutely. You know, small fishing, you know, operations, you wear, you wear a lot of different hats. And again, that goes to sort of the graying of the fleet. How do you pass down that knowledge? How do you pass down a knowledge of, you know, this is how you run a business, but you, you, it's not just fishing. It's okay. You know, you've got to figure out how do you label it, um, where you're going to sell it, what relationships you're going to forge. This is the kind of information that we need to make sure that we, we pass forward. Um, first of all, so far on all of that, any thoughts that anybody wants to share on that part? All right. Um, I think, oh, and the whole fish story, the whole fish and packaging. Like, uh, you know, if we, if we can get that gets that gets into education again, how do you have the conversation with the consumer? Hey, using the whole fish, every part of it, 
that's really important. Um, and that'll be something that comes up tomorrow in the deep dive with the indigenous access to food systems. That story will come up a few times in some of the storytellers that we have here. And talking about relationship to the resource, which again is important here, it has to go with packaging, that will come up again tomorrow. So um, does anybody have any final thoughts you wanna share? Because I'd like to jump in. Oh, go ahead. I just shared the link uh, to that fisheries forward, and uh, you know it's it's a tremendous uh, wealth of resources for fishermen. It teaches them you know how to sell direct to public, do trip tickets, uh, you know all these different things. And uh, there's a bunch of videos on there uh, that you know we went in and helped fishermen uh, try to teach them how to handle the product better, to you know icing and brine freezing and all the different uh, methods of handling the, you know, the seafood we produce and, uh, you know, these videos, uh, they really show, you know, fishermen how to do things right and how to do things better. Awesome. Lance, is, is that... It's, it's great to have these. Sorry. Um, I just wanted Go to ahead. ask Lance, is that is that Louisiana seafood? Hi, Lance. Hi. And, or is that Kendall? Is that Louisiana seafood who's doing that? No, that's uh, that's Sea Grant in coordination with the uh, Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. So, you know, they did that. Awesome. awesome. Okay, great to see you. And that's another thing, you know, with, with Slow Fish, we want to build a repository of this kind of information and make it available, you know, on our website so that it, it is, it becomes kind of a resource where fishermen can go and and sort of look at some of, of, of this information. Again, you know, we're, we're all about, you know, forging collaborations and, and networking where, where possible. Um, are there, does anybody have any other thoughts for, for yeah. closing hey, Carlos, today? I wanted to jump in. I've been listening to this and, and listening to you guys and um, cogitating on your, your question about how do we replicate these successes? And what occurs to me is that in every success that I've heard, it's all about the connections, if not the storytelling that happens. Um, so in the science world, we, we tell our stories in a much more boring way in the form of scientific papers. And that's how we share what we did, how we did it, so that another scientist can replicate that somewhere else in the world, hopefully anywhere else in the world that they have the same tools um, or figure out how to get those tools. And I feel like that in that replication, um, by telling these stories and connecting here and these other connections you made, you are you are replicating these successes. So it's my understanding that maybe Lance and Kayla met through Slow Fish or, or Local Catch Network. Um, and through sharing those stories, um, people, there've been advanced opportunities, people have learned more tools. I mean, I learned a ton from you guys that has really informed and nourished my career as well as helped me. I don't know if Jordan is still on, but um, with the slow food community, developing a slow fish um, campaign in San Diego. So I, I think the answer to your question, how do you re replicate these things? I, I think doing it, I think slow fish is doing it by creating these opportunities for folks to convene and to gather and to share their stories and make connections. And um, while I'm sad that we're again, not able to meet in person, I look forward to doing it again next year or doing it eventually next year. Like I said yesterday, God willing and the creek don't rise, we'll be doing it in person in New Hampshire in March. That's the plan. <laughs> that's, that's what's keep, that's our North star right now. So that's what we're, that's what we're looking at. Um, yeah, I mean, this has been, you know, fabulous. Um, seriously, this has been a great conversation. And again, I just, th this is one important conversation in hopefully an ongoing chain. And, you know, maybe this comes up in future webinar. Maybe we, we structure something specifically next year, but I agree with Sarah, you know, having these conversations is the first step and then taking the sort of calls to action or sort of the themes like we gathered today and bringing them forward. And that's what we're gonna do on the last day of this event on March 27th. 
we're going to have a synthesis and we're going to sort of reflect back some of the key themes from all of these deep dives and look at like how we can sort of um, match those to our collective path forward and you know ways that we can make them uh, inform how slow fish moves forward and and how we can you know continue to uplift the stories from you all um, and bring it all together so um, I, I just want to thank everybody um, you know this is this has been a great conversation I know it's been sort of a big big time crunch <laughs> but it's the fact that we still have a bunch of people on here after this time suggests that we've really been striking an important chord. Um, and that's that's really why we're doing this is to, to you know, resonate um, where it matters. So, um, Sarah, did you want to share anything at the end or shall I? All right. Do your thing. I'm so good. I'm just going to I just want to thank everybody and I'm going to just thank everybody. Um, all of our storytellers, you know, and thought leaders, you you all did such a great job. Um, Kayla Cox, Jordan Castlonger, Anna Shellum, who unfortunately she couldn't be here, but that video was amazing. Steve Curian, Lance Nacio, Jenny DeVivo, Kaylin Cedar, Marsh Skeel, Andrea Tomlinson, Jared Auerbach, and Sarah Schaffler and Elizabeth Herondine. You guys just, this is how I envisioned it and you just knocked it out of the park. So thank you. Um, also on the back end, uh, really, really thankful to Kaylee Mazakali and Amanda Davis, and especially Jennifer Halstead, who just magically appears wherever something is just about to go sideways and she straightens it out. So wanna thank everybody for that. Um, you see in the chat section, there is um, uh, Jennifer posted, um, a session where we can sort of, or, you know, go to, to sort of uh, continue conversations if we want to. Um, also, uh, I guess I'm going to, I'm going to turn it over to Kelly. Kelly, are you still um, on here? I believe you are. Kelly is our master MC. It was great to see everyone. I wish we could have a cocktail together. Oh. I know, I know. Tea it's sucks, up. right? I mean, <laughs> right? I know. <laughs> I have to take all I've got to do a cooking class. Right. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Thank you for everything you guys have. Peace out. Bye, Jenny. Thank you. So um, I am definitely. I want to eat shrimp master. with Lance. Yes, <laughs> I have shrimp coming soon. Um, but we're just, uh, we're going to wrap up here. Obviously, everyone's saying goodbye. That's wonderful. So we'll see you back here at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for last man fishing. Um, anything else, Collis? I think um, just if you haven't registered yet um, in the reception page, this is the time to register for next week. Um, yeah. Last man fishing at seven um, back here. And yeah. it's uh, the trailers in the expo section. And please check out the expo section when you have a chance, all the wonderful folks that have um, posted things um, and shared their businesses and some sponsors are all in there. Yeah. Um, do you have anything to say, Collis? Oh, just the other thing, I was just going to just re reiterate, I, I, I encourage everybody to check out the deep dive session tomorrow about yes. indigenous access to food systems. We, you know, these, we have some amazing speakers. Um, and they're going to tell some really powerful stories. And it's really important because we can all learn some lessons from that. You know, honoring the relationship to the resource. If you take care of the resource, it will take care of you. Right. It's as simple as that, but we've gotten so far away from that. So I, I just, I think it's a, a great conversation. I just, um, you know, I, I, I suggest tuning in. Thank you, Carlos. So, we'll see you at 12.15 12, tomorrow morning for that. And 12.30 yep. we'll start um, yep. with Indigenous access to the food sources. And thank you everyone on the supply side, all of these spaces that I can connect all the seafood I get shipped to me. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Thanks everybody, appreciate thank it. Thank you. Great to see you guys, Lance.
See you, Andrea. Take care. <laughs> hey, Lance. Yeah. Guess what I'm having for dinner tonight? Was that redfish or shrimp? Uh, yeah, it ain't no redfish. No, it's I got shrimp, uh, and it's either gonna be barbecue or beer batter. I just gotta figure out, you know, how much energy I got to do either or. So. Nice. Well, the redfish are biting again. I'm taking uh, oh, I'm taking Grayson Gill fishing tomorrow morning. All right. Oh, would you tell him I said hello? He's Weird. awesome. Yeah. He's like one of my favorite people. He's he's so cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, I took him fishing when the pandemic started, and uh, he was pretty sad, but uh, he's looking forward to going fishing and catching up tomorrow. Awesome. Yeah, and uh, yeah. So the 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 crawfish. All right. So is it? There's the crawfish that you ship, like, is it is it pre-cooked or is it frozen? It's or what, what live. It? It's live normally when I ship stuff. Live? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I got to I gotta seriously consider that. I mean, I can um, send you some that I cook myself, you know, when, when we do a boil. I can send you some. It's, it's easier to get them boiled, you know, and you just uh, heat them up. That would be the easier way. Because <laughs> live, <laughs> you, know, you need to cook them, you know, that day or the next day. All right, let me let me. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna think about that because yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. I'm so cute for crawfish. It's not even funny. They were real <laughs> last week. Thanks for all your work on this, guys. Yeah, thank you, Marsh. Uh, uh, really appreciate it. Um, yeah. You know how you doing? Anyway, I haven't had a chance to catch up with you. Oh, oh, good, good, busy, busy. Our season's just started, but bad weather yeah we need, we need a bunch of fish no but everyone's in town <laughs> march in alaska is still pretty wintry so yeah it's uh yeah. yeah no it's it's going good though uh yeah big, are you no, doing boat work no no uh i'm 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 not fishing my boat this year i'm, I'm trying to sell it so my dad and i have been doing little oh. boat projects but uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll go, I'll go how the fishing with him in, in like April or May, but I got a, um, our kind of plant manager has just had a baby. So he's going to be on paternity leave. So I got to, uh, kind of corral the fishermen for a while here this spring and make sure we get all the fish. Yeah. What was yeah. that we were talking about wearing different hats? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. And, uh, and yeah, Nick, Nick just stepped down a couple months ago from being CEO. So. Oh shit! So that's awesome. It's awesome for him, but that doesn't mean uh, doesn't mean that I got I got him in there to do all the work for me. So now there's a lot. <laughs> so he, oh shit! He made wow, it easy. I didn't know that. So yeah, no, it's good. It's good. We we grew we've grown a lot, you know, in the last couple yep. of years. So it's it's uh, now it's a bigger beast where you need some professional people to kind of manage it. It's it's more of a uh, yeah. So and we and he's still part of the company and like you know it's all good. But yeah, no, it's. It's been great, actually. And Kelly, awesome. Ke Kelly's still here kicking ass. And yeah, it's been good. She's doing great. Yeah, yeah. She, she does wonderful. So she's great to have on your team. <laughs> oh, totally. Totally. We, add, we added some good Alaska people. So yeah. All right. Well, I, I, I got to run, guys. Have a good one. Good to see you, Lance. Mm -hmm. right. I hope we'll look yeah. forward to getting together soon, hopefully next year. Yeah, absolutely. Right. That's the key. Sounds, sounds All right. Take good. care. All right. See you guys later. Yeah. See you, Lance. See ya.